Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to the UCD School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics Summer School. Hope you're having a good day wherever you are. My name is Emer Beasley and I work in the College of Arts and Humanities. And I will be joined by a range of colleagues from the School of Languages who are going to give you a stimulating range of lectures this afternoon. So you would have seen just there a beautiful picture of the iconic UCD lake on a bright and sunny day just like today. And whilst we would have loved to have had all of you join us on campus and get a feel for the beautiful campus at UCD, we are absolutely thrilled and be delighted to be joined by so many of you from all over the world. We have people joining us from the Netherlands, hello. We have people joining us from New York, California, Indonesia. We have a lot of Dublin people joining us, so you're all very welcome. We have people from Cavan, Roscommon, Baldoyle, Galway, Mayo, Sligo, Donegal and Kerry and far beyond. Pretty much every county is represented and a lot of countries around the world. So you're all very, very welcome. Uh, we've got an action packed schedule ready for you this afternoon. So I'm just going to give you a quick run through what you're going to be hearing today. And then I'm going to hand over to our first lecturer, Dr. Stephen Lucek, who's going to speak to you for uh, a few minutes about studying linguistics at UCD and about linguistics in general. He'll be followed up by Dr. Manu Bran Ancha, who will be giving you a lecture in French at 12.30. Um, uh, at 12.50, uh, Dr. Siobhan Donovan will be speaking to you about German. Swiftly moving on to Italia uh, with Dr. Ursula Fanning, followed by Spanish with Dr. Tara Plunkett, and literature, studying literatures with Derval Conroy. This will be followed up with a Q&A at the end uh, with students and staff from UCD. So it's an action-packed session we have planned for you. Hope you enjoy. And again, thank you so much for joining us from pretty much all over the world. You are all soyez les bienvenus. So just very quickly, a bit of housekeeping, just to let you know, uh, there's a chat box at the, the bottom uh, of the screen. Feel free to send in any of your questions. Uh, we'll, we will uh, be delighted to answer as, ma as many of them as we can in this time frame. Um, we will be taking a lot of questions at the end. So um, you can, we, we might not address your questions straight away, but we will address it at the end. So we look forward to hearing from you and we hope you enjoy these lectures and that you can find out more about the ways that you can study languages in UCD across our three major entry routes, which are joint honors, humanities and modern languages. So you'll hear about more of those as we come through and towards the end when we have the Q&A. But right now, sit back and enjoy this exciting range of lectures. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Stephen Lucek. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Amor. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the cave deal fault there. Uh, you'll notice there in the chat box, I've just put in a link uh, to Padlet. Uh, if anybody gets lost during the day, uh, or if there's some sort of um, Zoom malfunction, which uh, has happened from time to time, uh, it might be a good idea to keep that open in one of your uh, browser windows. Uh, you'll be able to um, see the times of the different talks, and there's links in each of the uh, uh, topic boxes. So, what is linguistics? I believe we have a show of hands feature. Um, if you know what linguistics is, if you've heard of it before, go ahead and chuck that hand up in the air. That's wonderful. This is great, I can just go home. Oh wait, I'm already at home. Sorry, it's been a long, 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 long lockdown. Um, a better question might be to say, before we talk about what is linguistics, um, we should probably get an idea for what language is. So capital L language, this huge, big concept um, that sometimes we don't think about every day. Sometimes it's, uh, it's just so second nature to us that we use language. It's just what we do. But have you ever thought about you know, what is language? Is it how we speak and how we write? Well, yeah, that's, that's part of it, for sure. Um, spoken language is you know, tens of thousands of years old. We have written language from at least 20,000 years ago. 
so this is something that we can chart. We can look at how languages change and their common ancestors as an indication of how long spoken language has been around. But we can have very, very clear cut evidence of how long written language has been there um, from archeological digs, all sorts of wonderful artifacts um, that show us written language from tens of thousands, for, you know, over 10,000 years ago. But what about computer language? Is that kind of like language too? Because when you're writing code in XML or Python, like you do have to have the correct syntax. Like that's, a, that's sort of a term that we use in computer programming uh, to make sure operations run properly. So computer language is sort of like language too, because it's conveying an idea. So now we're refining our definition of what language is. It's what we do when we open our mouths and when we write things down, but it's also how we make computers work. What about sign languages? Well, yeah, there's nothing necessarily written uh, in sign language. Yes, you can train people how to do sign uh, through written materials. Uh, but sign languages itself, sign languages themselves, I should say, they have their own set of rules and their own syntax, their own way of organizing thoughts and ideas. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. But what is this? What's this gesture? What am I always doing with my hands? Aside from being a little bit, you know, jacked up on having a couple of cup of coffee, cups of coffee, uh, I use gesture quite a bit. And I'd say most of us use gesture. Gesture is just something we do to convey ideas. And without using written or spoken language, we can convey ideas. These are all different types of gestures. Out of here. That, that, that's a gesture. It's conveying an idea, but it's not necessarily uh, a clear cut spoken or written sign. Oh, now it's signs. Sign, that doesn't necessarily mean signed language, does it? Signs are ideas. What about our thoughts? Do you think our thoughts are language? Well, in a way, most of us do something up here before we do something up here. We're doing something cognitively. We're forming thoughts. We are making ideas. Something up here is telling this thing down here how to move the lips, how to move the tongue in the mouth, how to say specific things. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. We've got spoken and written language. We have computer languages. We have sign languages. We have gesture. We have thoughts. When you read, do you ever hear a voice? About a quarter of us, maybe a little bit more, when we read something, I'm obviously including myself, uh, reading anything at all, we hear the words that are written on the page. Usually it's my own voice, but sometimes if I'm reading a biography, if it's Robbie Keane's autobiography and I know what he sounds like, I'll hear some of the book in his voice. Certainly where there are quotations and news stories, I'll hear a famous person's voice. So there's some language going on with reading as well. There's research done by um, a former PhD student at UCD that looks at what accent you hear in. So how do you hear accent? This is all wonderful stuff. This is language perceptions and our thoughts about language. We have a lot of terminology around this very big concept of language. And these are some terms you'll come across uh, if you do decide to study linguistics in UCD. When we're building up a base for language, we have the person, one individual language user. And the way they speak is an idealect. So you can think of some people perhaps in your own life, perhaps people you see on the news, uh, who have a very specific way of using language. It could be their accent, it could be the way they make uh, plurals, uh, how they uh, structure sentences, even their relationship with the truth. This is all idealectal aspects of language use. 
We also have local dialects. So this is one that we're all very well familiar with. Sometimes we call this accent, but how the people in your neighborhood, maybe in your postcode, your part of a city, your county, how people there use language. Because a lot of times we do things to sound like the people around us, to make us feel more like the people around us. Other times we do the opposite. We try to sound unlike the people around us to set ourselves apart from the people around us. These are all aspects of sociolinguistics. We do a lot of sociolinguistics in UCD. The next level up will be a regional dialect. If you think about Ireland, uh, different regions of the country have different sound patterns for sure, even some um, morphological patterns. And I'm using some technical terms here that I'll explain in a moment. But uh, terminology is different in different parts of the city, different parts of the country, different parts of the world. So regional dialects affects how people living in your area use language. And then there's language. Now this isn't the big concept of language that lives up here. What about a language? Uh, is English a language or are there different types of English? Are there different varieties of English? What does it mean that English is different in Ireland than it is in Botswana, than it is in Canada, than it is in China? A language, it's a really big concept, almost as big as this language complex that happens up here and here and here and here. It might be a good idea to look at how we visualize the world's languages because it's difficult to think of all these billions of people, all with very similar brains, very similar brain types, different lobes that do different things to make us stand up and walk and converse. There's an awful lot of different types of languages. So sometimes we use trees as a metaphor for language, the old notion of a family tree. So here is a family tree of old world language families. So Indo-European is here in the middle. Let's see if I can get my pencil out. Uh, pen color, yeah, let's go with yellow. Right here, we got Indo-European. It's one of our ancestors in spoken language. And we go out in different directions, the European branch, the Indo-Iranian branch, all the way out to individual languages that are spoken today, Hindi, Bengali, Spanish, you name it. Most of the world's languages are there, but you know what? Not every language is there. There are a lot of languages in the world. What else can we do to visualize? Well, we can use circles either. Each of these circles represents the proportion of the world's population using individual languages. So 873 million people use Mandarin on a daily basis. 508 million use Span uh, English, sorry. Uh, and then Hindi, Spanish, Arabic, Bengali, Russian. There are, you know, a lot of different languages. There's so many tiny little dots. What, how many languages are there in the world? Well, Ethnolog, which is a group that charts how many languages are used in the world, says there's at least 7,102 living languages in the world. You can see they're almost you know, that's more than half in Asia and Africa. And we have the Pacific, uh, the Americas, and Europe only has 286 languages, but sure, Europe is a pretty linguistically diverse place, but there's 286 languages. That's, that's a very small proportion of the overall number of languages in the world. So these are just just different ways of visualizing the number of languages in the world, but still, these are valuable tools in understanding linguistic variety. So what is linguistics? Well, 
Simply put, it's the scientific study of the nature of language use and communication. If you're studying linguistics with us in first year, you'll take a course called Language Use and Communication. Uh, because language and communication are slightly different things. There's lots of different types of communication that happens in the world. But in order to be termed a language, we have to have intent. So trees and bees and birds, they all communicate, but they don't use language. You might think that when you have a very special bond with a dog, that they understand your language and you understand their language. Well, I'm not going to get involved in that particular relationship, but uh, I do stress that dogs don't actually use language themselves. They may be able to process commands, sure, uh, but that's not really language, that's communication, which is valuable in and of itself. Uh, but in linguistics, we study uh, the structures of language. So we have phonetics, the, the production, the acoustics, and hearing of speech sounds. So individual sounds, t, p, b. That's elements of phonetics. Phonology is when we start putting those sounds together. Apple, baby. Morphology is how we structure words, so how we make the past tense, how we make plurals, all that good stuff. Many of the world's languages are incredibly complex morphologically. Uh, we can look at syntax, uh, the structure of sentences. So uh, does the structure of a sentence go noun, verb, object? Um, is it object first? Is it verb first? All this stuff. So that's parts of syntax, the structure of sentences. In semantics, we look at meaning. Uh, what is the objective meaning of a thing? Um, after this, we have pragmatics. So this is language in context. How does meaning in the larger sense, the objective sense, become subjective meaning? That's pragmatics. And here's a nice circle graph of, of how structuring language works. So we start from the inside of phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. And these are all topics that come up in your stud core study in uh, linguistics in UCD. Right. So why would you study linguistics? Uh, you're a linguist, how many languages do you speak? This is something that linguists hear all the time. Um, we usually have snappy answers, like you don't ask a doctor how many diseases they have. Um, but linguists know more about the structure of languages, how they work, and how they're used in everyday um, conversations and general interactions than we do about individual language that, languages that we speak, though most of us uh, can speak several languages. So is linguistics a science? Well, yeah, sort of, but it's not a STEM science, obviously. Uh, we do use the same types of scientific methods uh, in linguistics that they do in the so-called hard sciences, um, but we use them to observe human behavior um, and sometimes not very human behavior. Um, because humans use language and other forms of communication, linguists are here to record that use and to analyze it. And sometimes we could even make predictions. Um, some of our graduates go on to do um, very intricate uh, tech jobs. So you could be a data analyst in LinkedIn, for example. I'm just plucking a job title and a company out of, uh, out of the top of my head here. Um, but if you uh, study linguistics, you're getting ready to do different types of work, um, like any job uh, or any course of study. Um, in studying linguistics, you focus on how language is acquired, both as a first language and as a second language. Um, so English might be your first language and maybe Spanish is your second language. Uh, we look, as I said, about how language is structured. 
but we also have a strong focus in UCD on how people use language and that's getting at sociolinguistics, how social factors affect language use and how social factors affect language use variation. You'll also develop some soft skills in studying linguistics. Yes, uh, you'll have a lifelong interest in your field of study, naturally, uh, and we'll, we'll teach you as much as we can about language science. Uh, but along the way, you're also going to develop these soft skills, critical thinking, uh, you learn to be intellectually independent um, through different types of uh, teaching. We're teaching you um, to be independent, to evaluate evidence on your own. Um, your assignments, your written assignments, sometimes your oral assignments, if you're doing uh, courses with um, presentation work, um, you're learning different ways of conveying messages of communicating your ideas through words, either written or spoken. Uh, you're refining your analytical skills. You're learning different ways to solve problems. You're demonstrating research ability. You're showing that you can take a problem in, ling in language or in linguistics. Maybe that's um, how frequently do teenagers use the word like. Through taking our courses and understanding how other people have studied similar topics, you can see there are specific methods that you should probably follow. And there are ways to answer these questions that we will teach you. You'll obviously learn about time management because every course will tell you that you'll learn about time management because it's not secondary school, it's third level, it's university. You're going to be asked a lot and you'll get a lot. So you'll get back what you put in. And you're learning also about how to express yourself, how to take a professional approach to conveying very complex ideas. So just to recap, we talked about language, spoken and written language, computer programming language, signed languages, gesture, thoughts, reading, these are all part of language because language is a complex concept. We have different ways to study it and we have different ways of analyzing it, but essentially language is all the same. We all do similar things with language as the linguist job to find out how we're doing them. We take the scientific approach to studying language because we're superheroes, but don't tell anyone. Uh, and studying linguistics that you see, it's, it's pretty great, I gotta say. Um, and it's also great to study languages at UCD. So uh, in our school, we have quite a lot of uh, overlap in our research interests for sure. Um, and I'm sure uh, Bettina will be able to tell you later on today about different ways of combining subjects in your major, um, but it's a pretty great place to learn. Uh, and then one more thing there, uh, and that's me wearing my language variationist hat. I can't really let you all stop listening to uh, a talk about linguistics without emphasizing that language is always changing. If you try to read uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, if you try to read uh, Shakespeare, you'll know that there are different ways of uh, expressing this English language that we, you know, we all think we, we're using right now. So language changes over time, but people in different places are also changing language. Language change is in the hands of the language users. And one great thing that we get to do as human beings is we get to decide for ourselves if language change is a good or a bad thing. I'm pretty sure it's a good thing, but hey, do it agree with us and maybe you can tell me at the end what you think about language change. So thanks very much. Um, that's many, many languages. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Um, and I believe we have a minute or two for questions. Thank you, Stephen. Right on time. We have exactly two minutes for questions. You are the perfect lecturer. Thank you.
So would anyone like to send some questions through on the text box, on the chat? Let us know if you have any questions. We'd love to hear from you and you can save your questions until the end if, if that's better for you. I think there might be a hand up. Do we have a hand up there. Ah, here we go. Okay, Grace, we're going to put you on blast. All right. Let's see, is she off mute? Unmute. I'll read out a few that are coming in before we put okay. on blast. Are there linguistic modules in language courses in UCD like the Modern Languages course? Um, they are and they aren't because they're different types of subject matter. Um, you'll be hearing very interesting talks from each of our language uh, departments about how they teach their languages. And they will be teaching you not just language, but culture and literature as well in those chosen languages. Um, linguistics is a little bit different uh, because we'll be teaching you about um, a lot of theories about language change, theories about um, what it means to be a noun, for example, uh, nouniness, we call it. Um, there's a lot of um, different types of investigation that you'll learn about in linguistics that isn't quite the same um, as languages, but at the same time, we do, like I say, we, we cross over. So I might be investigating uh, the different types of nouns that Baudelaire uses. Uh, and Manu, our next speaker, might be looking at uh, different concepts in Baudelaire, like how does Baudelaire approach uh, springtime? I don't know. Uh, but it, it's, it's more of a, the literature people take more of a big picture look uh, at themes, right? So I think that's a little bit different than uh, the way that, um, maybe strategies towards expressing meaning. Um, I hope that helps. That's great. Thank you very much. And there's a lot more questions coming in, which is great to see. And we'll take them all towards the end of this lecture, if that's OK. If you're happy with that, Stephen. That sounds great to me. Thanks very much. Fantastic. So without further ado, we might, ha we might move swiftly into French which is next up on our action-packed schedule. And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Manu Braganza, who is originally from Paris and is now working at UCD, having worked in Nottingham and in Belfast before joining us in UCD. Le voilà. Bonjour et soyez le bienvenu, Manu. How are you? Okay. Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome to my living room. I didn't know that I could host so many people in my living room, but here we are. That's the magic of technology. So I'm uh, uh, Dr. Manu Bragansa and I'm going to uh, play a PowerPoint slide and I hope it works. Uh, just let me know if it doesn't. Yeah, can you see something there? I can see something there, yeah. Uh, if you could maybe do play slides just so it's safe. Perfect. Parfait. Okay, so uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, and so I'm going to deal with these three topics. First, I'm going to say a few words about the staff in UCD and our expertise. Then I will say a few words about the module and the curriculum. And finally, I will just highlight some uh, key features of uh, French at UCD. And I should say from the beginning that we are not super heroes, unlike uh, people in linguistics. Uh, and there is my email address there if you have any queries uh, well at the end of the talk but also um, uh, later on in the day or tomorrow please drop me an email that's not a problem at all so in terms of staff and expertise we are nine members and uh, we are in fact the biggest uh, french department in ireland uh, this means that we have actually a very broad expertise uh, in terms of genre. So if you're interested in literature, uh, several colleagues work on literature, fiction, essays, but also drama, poetry, cinema, and more. Um, we are interested, of course, in highbrow literature and culture, uh, 
so the well-known French uh, writers, Zola, Hugo, and more. But we are also interested in popular culture, in low-brow culture. So for example, I work with comics, documentaries, uh, newspapers, TV series, so I use a lot of sources in my uh, research and some colleagues do the same. So we're trying really to have a, a mix of highbrow and lowbrow culture. Why this? Because uh, not everyone is interested in uh, highbrow uh, literature and culture, uh, but we all watch TV series, we all listen to songs, uh, read comics maybe, read literature, which you know we know it's not great literature, great literature but it's entertaining and so on and so forth. So we, we really try to map French literature and culture very, very broadly. Uh, we have a colleague working in French linguistics, so it's linguistics applied to French language specifically, and colleagues working on French literature, history of ideas, and philosophy. And I'm saying this because French is really a, a multidisciplinary uh, field. Uh, you learn a language, but through the language, you learn a lot about French culture, French history, uh, French sociology, French economy, and so on. And I say French, but I should say French and francophone, uh, because some colleagues work on Canada, North Africa, and uh, Caribbean. Because, of course, uh, most French speakers now are not in France. Um, Roughly speaking, uh, approximately 300 million uh, French people, uh, people speak French, but only 65 are in, in France. So when you study French studies, you should think in terms of French and Francophone, and bearing in mind that most French speakers are actually outside of France and not in France. And, and we also cover uh, French language from the 17th century to the 21st century. So from basically uh, the Enlightenment, even before, to the very contemporary uh, uh, France. Uh, this is us. We are not superheroes, as I said, but we are beautiful. And if you ever see me in black and white, that's me there. Just, I don't know why my picture is in black and white, but it, it, it is. So nine uh, members of staff plus uh, lecturers uh, and lectrices. So we have native French speakers that join us uh, every year, plus some teaching assistants. And I also yes wanted to say very very briefly that you will learn with us the language, French language, language modules, but also content modules. Um, in a range of options and elective modules. This is a bit technical, but keep this in mind. It's a language and a content module. And I will give you some examples later. So this is uh, not specific to French, but how it works is in year one, we actually give you the basis. We want to make sure that you all have the basis, uh, the same basis. So year one is really focused on the principles, as it says your brochure and for most uh, disciplines. In year two, then you get to deepen your understanding, but also choose the options that you prefer. If you are very interested in cinema, for example, we have some modules uh, on French cinema. If you are really interested in uh, philosophy, there's a module which, which deals with uh, individualism, uh, what is identity, basically. So it's how French thinkers will learn um, uh, philosophy. If you're interested in literature, Quebec, we have uh, uh, liter more literary uh, modules as well. And finally, in year three, you refine your knowledge. Uh, there, you really get to grasp with the nuances of uh, language. Okay, so this is very broadly speaking uh, what we do. First year, first year is very very general, and then you dive into uh, more specific topics that you. So these are just some examples of modules that we offer. Uh, and I'm going to say just a few words about these, but you have many more uh, on the web and I will uh, give you some links uh, afterwards. So the first one um, there is called Versailles, Power, Politics and Spectacle. So it's about power in France at the end of the 17th century and beginning of the 18th century. It's really about, it's called Versailles, power, politics, and spectacle, but it's really about power 
propaganda and media at that time. Versailles was the capital of France and then it became uh, Paris. But it's really how th the king managed to use the media uh, uh, as propaganda to serve his own political power. I uh, very recently uh, moderated some scripts and there are very striking parallels with uh, what's happening in the US at the minute and the UK as well. So it's, uh, it's not because it deals with the 17th century that it's something that is not relevant to, uh, to contemporary France and, uh, and our world. The second module then, uh, French New Wave, uh, it's about uh, French cinema after the Second World War. So if you're interested in cinema, this is a really a, a wonderful module. It's about how the French try to develop their own brand of cinema, which was a sort of uh, anti-Hollywood uh, cinema. It, it was cinema perceived as an act of writing as opposed to a multi-million dollar project uh, to produce something uh, spectacular. So something much more intimate and uh, it was really a, a sort of rebellion against uh, uh, Hollywood, a very uh, interesting wave of cinema. Uh, literature of Quebec there, I don't think I need to explain this one very much. It's about the literature of Quebec, so the francophone part of uh, Canada. Uh, but again, this reflects that uh, French is not spoken, uh, spoken only in France, it's spoken mainly outside of France. Uh, and I said earlier on that approximately 300 million uh, people speak French. In 25 years time, this number is going to double because most uh, French speakers are now in Africa uh, because many countries are uh, former French colonies and, uh, and the birth uh, rate, the natality is actually very, very high. Uh, so within 25 years, um, French, uh, the number of French speakers is going to double and French will be the second most spoken language in the world. And for some uh, uh, scholars, it may actually become the first uh, language spoken in, uh, in, uh, in about 30, 35 years. So it's really, uh, it, it's really growing. And it's also a soft power uh, because it's one of the official language languages of the UN and of uh, the International uh, Tribunal and more. Uh, moving on to different modules, keeping an eye on the time. La France d'aujourd'hui, so that's a module that I uh, coordinate. So La France d'aujourd'hui, Contemporary France, uh, it's really a, a multidisciplinary uh, module. So it's about France today, but it's about its history, it's about its economy, uh, its society, its culture. It's really a, a very, very broad module. And it's a year two module. Why uh, a year two module? The point is to prepare you for your year abroad if you decide to go abroad uh, for uh, your third year. So it's really to, uh, to give you a broad understanding of what France is and to get you ready as well. We, we give you very practical advice about when you go to France um, uh, in terms of accommodations, in terms of healthcare, in terms of this and this and that. It's also packed with uh, advice to help you uh, move uh, abroad for uh, one year uh, if you choose to, to do so. Uh, and just a few words about the last module called Research in French. Uh, so this, in fact, overlaps a little bit with what uh, Steve said uh, earlier on. Uh, this module, Research in French, it's ready to allow you to uh, develop, to explore a topic that you really, really enjoyed. So say, for example, if you uh, picked the French New Wave module in year two, you may be very interested in cinema in one specific aspect. Uh, so in this case, uh, you will need to contact uh, the module coordinator and say, I really enjoyed this module. Uh, this aspect seemed very, very interesting. Could I do a research project on this? So it's really uh, to be guided very closely, closely by um, um, a member of French at UCD on a topic that you choose. So it's really to do something that was never done before, a new topic. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I supervised two uh, research in French projects this year, uh, and one of them was about um, uh, 
an extreme right journalist, which uh, was unknown 10, 15, 10, 15 years ago. It's called Eric Zemmour. And now he, he has really become a, a mainstream figure in France. And this project was really about how he managed to, um, to work his way through the media, how he moved from being a, a journalist in a newspaper into a TV journalist and how he dealt with the media, how he managed to become a mainstream figure of the extreme right so close to the Front National, this extreme uh, right uh, party, and how he became mainstream. So that's just to give you an example of uh, proje a project in research in French. So moving on, uh, not that quickly, these are two websites where you can find uh, more modules that we offer. These are really just a sample, so you can write them down or just Google. If you Google my UCD uh, French, you will find the first link. And for the second one, if you uh, just Google SLCL, so that's the School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics, uh, and then French staff, you will find uh, Various, uh, you, you'll find the profiles of the stuff I showed you uh, earlier on. And I do encourage you to do this because what we teach is what we research. Uh, so if you look at our publications, uh, it's really very close to what we, we, we teach. Okay, All our teaching is research led. Uh, and I'm saying this also because you, uh, I know I should promote UCD because uh, you're looking at this. Um, uh, webinar now, uh, but I would encourage you to look at what other um, universities do. Uh, look at what they do in Trinity, look at what they do in Limerick, and look at the profiles uh, because you need to um, you need to like what uh, people there uh, teach as well. So choose your university depending on what you see there. Uh, look at the research profile. If you like the research, then that's probably uh, the right uh, university. Right. Moving on very, very quickly now. Um, just one word on uh, new perspectives in French studies, because it's something that we um, uh, do a lot in UCD. So traditionally, scholars uh, worked on the text and the writer, or the text, the film, and the filmmaker. And there was a sort of idea that you studied the text, to understand the writer, and you study the writer to understand the text. This is not an interesting. What we do is you actually exclude millions of people. Uh, you study a few writers, and what we try to do in new CD in particular is to include us, the readers, the film goers. Um, so it's not just to try to understand what the what a, a writer wanted to say but it's more to understand the effect of what they produced on us. So questions that, questions that uh, we are particularly interested in, and I'm, I'm going to stop there, uh, include, for example, how can a literary success be explained? Why do we all buy the same books at one specific point? Or, uh, why and how do some books or films become classics? Who decides this? decides that this author has to be studied by all uh, um, um, kids between 12 and 14, for example. So it's the, the process, it's literature in context, it's a much wider uh, process. Another question that particularly interests me is this, why do we feel real emotions when we read fiction or when we watch a film? We know it's an invented story, yet we have real emotions, not emotions that are invented. So how does it work? All of this to say that what we try to do in UCD is literature and culture in context. And by context, I mean linguistics, sociology, psychology, philosophy, history. This, again, to say that uh, French, French studies is actually a multidisciplinary uh, field. It's not just French language, it's French language and content. And this includes many, many disciplines. And I think I'm going to stop there because I'm already over time. I wanted to tell you about Another module that I run, but I'm going to skip this. If you have any questions, you can ask them now, send an email to the school, or send an email to myself or to a colleague, uh, Dr. Derval Conroy, who is also in French, and who will be speaking uh, later this afternoon, I think at half two. Or... Okay, 
that's me. Fantastique. Thank you very much for that wonderful lecture, Manu. Uh, we have had quite a few questions through. One of the questions, Manu, that we've got a few um, variations on is, how can people prepare to study French? What sort of reading or films or what sort of things should people do to prepare to study French at UCD? For me, the, really the most important is to enjoy it. Uh, you know, people say, oh, uh, can you recommend, uh, especially now students, you know, for the break are recommending, can you recommend um, uh, some grammar textbook that I could really, really, uh, you know, go through uh, over the summer? And that's all very good. You can do this. Students can do this. But I think you need to enjoy it. So my... Uh, my advice is always try to find something that you enjoy. If you enjoy cooking, why don't you try to look for a French website uh, where, where you have re recipes? You have a wonderful one called Marmiton, for example. If you, if you Google, you know, these sort of things that you like and you try to find something um, that, that you like specifically, you will do it. Uh, if you open a grammar textbook, you may do a couple of pages or exercises, but you are likely to give up. Uh, so my advice would be try to do something that you that you like. And if this, uh, these individuals want to send me emails, I can recommend this. Uh, I'm actually putting together now uh, a sort of uh, page with uh, one best of or one recommended of. So I'm recommending one novel to students, one website to students, one recipe to students, one MOOC uh, to students. So I, I'm, I'm sort of putting things together, but it depends on their interests as well. So my advice is do something that you enjoy. If you enjoy it, you will do it. That is such wonderful advice. And just to let everybody know, we can share that reading list with you in the follow-up next week. Uh, we've people asking for any recommendation in films, authors, and things like that. So for those interested, we will share those resources with you next week. So thank you again, Manu, for joining us. Could I ask you to stop sharing your screen now? Of course, yes. Just one second. We're going to make way for Siobhan Donovan, who is to speak about German and studying German at UCD. Okay. Siobhan, good to see you. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Not at all. Right, okay. So, guten Tag und herzlich willkommen. I'm going to get my um, presentation up and running now. Um, we obviously all wish we were doing something with you live um, and you were in our, um, we were with you. Okay, I hope everybody can see my first screen, which should say guten Tag und herzlich willkommen. I'm Siobhan Donovan and I am Head of German at the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. Um, and I have three pictures here for you at the start, because obviously German is spoken in Europe in three countries. It's spoken in Austria and you see there the Stephansdom in Vienna. It's spoken in Switzerland and you see images of wonderful um, Alpine peaks. And it is spoken in Germany, and there you have an image of the Brandenburger Tor, the Brandenburg Gate. Um, this is our door, our gateway into our School of Languages, and we wish that we were doing this in person with you. Um, but we hope to welcome you there when you do come and join us. Um, and for now, I want to give you a little overview about what we do and focus on the cultural and the linguistic aspects. So, you can do German, as you probably already know, like many of the other languages, within a number of different degree programs as part of the regular BA, as part of the BAIML, International Modern Languages, where you would do two or more languages. Within BA Humanities, and there are two so-called pathways, one of them is languages, literatures and cultures, and the other is English, European and world literatures. We also teach German as a minor to the Bachelor of Commerce International, and we teach German as part of the Social Sciences Programme. So we, we, we feed into a lot of, of different degrees or different degree programmes. 
if you come to study German with us um, later on as UCD, what sort of things will you be studying? Well, we aim to um, increase your linguistic fluency and also your cultural awareness. Now, I should say straight away that German, like Spanish and like Italian, you're able to study from beginners or from non-beginners. So if you've been doing German for the Leaving Cert or you've done uh, a number of years of German before, it's non-beginners German. If you are doing German for the first time, it's beginners German. So we aim to give all our students a degree of linguistic fluency, but also to introduce them to the different cultural aspects of the German speaking countries. So I've put in green the, the different elements of linguistic fluency, and they are, of course, speaking, listening, writing and reading the four traditional language skills. And then under cultural awareness, we will have modules or courses that look at history, that deal with society, and that look at the different cultures. So literature, the visual cultures of, of the different uh, German speaking countries. And they're a, a sort of a sequence of concentric circles. So they all sort of um, uh, join together. If we're thinking of culture, some of these people you may recognize, you will certainly recognize the smiling face in the middle um, as Angela Merkel. Um, and I suppose she is the ultimate uh, figure of German politics and society. You might recognize Sigmund Freud, the Austrian psychoanalyst. Um, we might be doing something about him. You may have heard of Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. You might have heard of Goethe's Faust or the Goethe Institute in town. You probably won't have heard of Peter Bixel, who is a Swiss writer, um, but who wrote a number of rather uh, eccentric stories, and some of them are Kindergeschichten, and they're really, really delightful. And you may or may not have heard of someone like Jenny Erpenbeck, who is a contemporary writer, um, who was originally from the former East, and whose book Go Went Gone in translation has become a bestseller. So, just an idea of some of the cultural and political things we'd be talking about if you study German with us. Now, I hope you all recognize this building. It is, of course, der Reichstag, the Reichstag, the Parliament building in Berlin. Many of you will have been to Berlin. And you can see it's dedicated to dem Deutschen Volke, the German people. Um, and I suppose the reason I'm showing you this is to give you a nice image of Berlin, but also to suggest that if you are in Berlin and you wanted to know how to get there and you were asking in German, you would say maybe, wo ist der Reichstag? Or you might say, wie komme ich am besten zum Reichstag? Um, and I hope if you have no German at all, that will make a bit of sense to you. The point is here, if you're asking the question, if we're teaching you German, it's language as a tool, okay? And that's largely what you would have learned at school. When you come to do German or any language at university, it's also the cultural aspect that is hugely important. So when we think about the Reichstag, we might uh, ask ourselves, when was it built? It was built in 1894. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. Um, it was built by someone called Paul Vallaud, and it was built really on foot of German uh, unification in 1871, and it was dedicated to the people, dem Deutschen Volke. And I suppose the way it's built demonstrates how Germany wants to be seen. Um, and if we discuss the Reichstag throughout the history, we see the Reichstag as being a symbol, as being a symbol of Germany, and maybe a symbol of what uh, German history stands for. So you may or may not know that the Reichstag's Brand, it was burnt down famously um, when the Nazis came to power in 1933. And I suppose the fate of the Reichstag mirrors the history of Germany. And in order to understand the German culture, the German language, you have to understand a bit about the history. So when the building was burnt down, Weimar democracy was destroyed. We had the war, the Second World War. At the end of the war, you had the Germans defeated. And we know that there was a, a meaningful anniversary, war anniversary there just in, in May. And you may have seen a very moving celebration in Berlin 
of the German politicians seated all socially distanced and, and reflecting on the war and again asking for forgiveness and asking for apology. So the Germans very much um, took responsibility for the Holocaust and for the terrible atrocities that, that uh, Hitler's um, Nazis committed. And then of course in happier times uh, you move on and you have the Reichstag rebuilt and uh, I suppose if you think about Dem Deutschen Volke that's written over the front of it to the German people you had with reunification in 1989 and 1990 the idea of one people so no longer two German peoples east and west but one people coming together. Okay, that was a little excursus into history and I am going to tell you the kind of uh, seminars uh, that we offer you when uh, in, in a few minutes. So just just hang on there. Um, it's nearly lunchtime and so some of you uh, may be thinking of food. I know I certainly am when I finish this. And this is an example of a concrete poem. All right. So it is a picture of an apple. I hope you can see that and I hope you can see apple written and you might just about see a worm, a worm. And this is an example of, of concrete poetry where the language becomes its own reality and it's meant to be accessible to everybody. So, so what is the poem telling us? There's only, it's only consisting of two words, um, one word repeated many times, but perhaps in something there is perhaps some degree of rottenness. You have to be careful what's going to pop out. There's a certain element of surprise. And you can see that the way the, the script, the, the typography is done, it's meant to look like an apple and it does. So we would use poetry in teaching. We would use poetry in teaching language as well. And concrete poetry is poetry that is very visual, where the form is central. The form is more important than the sounds or the meaning. So it's very suitable if we're teaching German to beginners because uh, many beginners could understand it as well. And this is a poem by Eugen Gomringer. And Eugen Gomringer said that poetry should be as easily understood as signs in airports and traffic signs, okay? And language takes on its own reality. It becomes central stage, but the form of it does. Now, if we were in a classroom, I would ask you here, would you know what the word schweigen means? And some of you wouldn't, and some would, and some would say, well, schweigen, it is ending in en, and it's got a small s, so it has to be um, the infinitive form of a verb, and I'd say, great. And you would say, well, it maybe means, if you looked it up, to be silent or to fall silent. And I'd say, that's absolutely right. And I'd say to you, well, then why is there a gap in the middle? And you'd say, gosh, hmm, how do you represent silence? How do you represent silence with words? You can only do it by taking out a word. And I would then say to you, and another thing these um, concrete poets do, and it was called concrete poetry because um, it was first exhibited alongside an exhibition of concrete art in Brazil in 1950, so it's a universal movement. Um, Schweigen, if it was written with a capital S, it could also mean silence because these poets, they play around with words and they play with language and they often disregard capital letters and small letters and capital letters initially are the bane of our lives um, when we're starting to learn. German, but it gets easier, of course, as you as you go on. So that's a little excursus into poetry and how with poetry, you know, you can gain an insight into a culture, um, but you can also learn a language. You can learn new words. You can practice the pronunciation or the Sprach melody, the melody of the language. Um, you could be exposed to different terms, to different cultures, to otherness, to strangeness. Um, and it might also change your perspective, uh, your perspective on how, how we deal with language and what we think of our, our own language, our, our mother tongue, our, our first tongue. So I wonder if you wanted to, you could create your own concrete poem at home. You could send it to us. The email address would be slcl. Um, um, and I'd be very happy to read it and I'd comment on it for you. I would say you choose a word, maybe coronavirus. It's one of these words that is everywhere. Maybe unsicherheit, uncertainty. There's a certain amount of that around at the moment. Sommer, we're in the middle of it. 
Hoffnung, hope, Glück, happiness. So I've moved from kind of uncertainty to, 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 to hope. What do you associate with the word? And then how can the associations be expressed visually on the page? So if you want to do that, please do and send it to me and I would love to um, read it. This is another concrete poem and it consists of two words in columns, Ordnung and Unordnung. The Germans, I think you'll agree, and the Swiss and Austrians love order. And here it's trying to show you when you step out of order, what happens and how Unordnung is sort of contained in the word Ordnung or order. And to get a bit of order into things and to tell you about the sorts of courses you will study with us, I'm going to turn to this now. So if you came to do German with us in the autumn trimester, um, you would take language modules um, and I have colored those in red and in green. So if you have done German at school or you've done many years of German, you take the non-beginners route. So in the autumn trimester, you would do German language 1A and in the spring trimester, German language 1B. If you're beginners, you do German beginners A and then German beginners B in the spring trimester. And then because in addition to language, we're also trying to introduce you to the culture and history and society. We have two modules in the first semester. And if you have German and you're a non-beginner, you would take reading German literature. And we have a number of different short stories and poems we look at. If you don't have German, you would do spoken German for beginners to increase your exposure to German. In the spring trimester, then we have a module German history on screen, which looks at a number of German films with a historical component. And that is both accessible to people just starting learning German and people who've been learning German for a number of years. Now, with all our modules, it depends how many the numbers you do will depend on whether you're doing a full BA or you're doing modern languages or whether you're taking German as, as a minor as part of social sciences or as part of Commerce International or even as an elective. So that's what you would do in first year with us. If you want to stay on with us, moving ahead then, um, to give you a flavour of what we do in second year or stage two as we call it, you will have core language modules. So typically they're 2A and 2B or German X beginners A and German X beginners B. And then there's a range of other cultural and option modules. So for example, at the moment, we have a module on adapting the Grimm's Tales, which also looks at the Disneyfication of the Grimm's, among other things. There's a module on the German speaking Enlightenment, which was the movement of learning in the uh, 18th century. Um, and uh, there are a number of uh, 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 plays and um, an opera looking at the uh, delightful magic flute in that module. We have a translation module, German uh, in English into German. We have a module called Transcultural Encounters, which looks really at a poetry written by, by non-native Germans. So typically um, maybe uh, Germans who um, were originally Turkish and have settled in Germany and have become German, German citizens. We have a module on radical thinkers, which looks at some big names of German uh, philosophers and, and thinkers like Luther and Kant and these people. If you want to go in Erasmus, and you'll be hearing more about Erasmus in one hour and 10 minutes, so I won't mention that now. We have different um, partnerships with Germany and Austria and um, different universities. Um, and it is a compulsory part of the degree for certain um, degrees um, and it's optional for others. Then you would come back after Erasmus or if you haven't gone abroad and do core language modules 3A and 3B. At this point, beginners and non-beginners are together um, in, in one module and then a selection of other cultural uh, modules and I have a list of, of those there. So contemporary prose, translation German into English, modernist German literature, transcultural encounters, picking up on transcultural encounters one. And then if you're interested in thinking about research, you can write your own dissertation with assistance and supervision from, from, um, from myself and my colleagues.
There are a number of language societies and very many extracurricular activities. The world really is your oyster. And we are so fortunate to have the wonderful Goethe Institute on our doorsteps. And, and we uh, do, do a lot with them and we encourage our students to go there. So it's very much about uh, learning outside of the classroom, outside of the, of the uh, VLE, the virtual learning environment and doing language with other students and, and, and just because you want to do it. People ask us what our graduates do. There's a few examples here. So I could have gone on for uh, much longer. Uh, many of you will already have heard of Angus Cox, the RTE broadcaster. Well, he did German and economics. Um, uh, different people have done many different things. John, I'm just mentioning John because his Culture Me website is really fascinating. It's a website if you want to look it up. And he's traveled around many places around the world and gives lots of different tips. Um, right, I'm going to stop here now because I want to give you time to ask any questions. I can see uh, from the chat that there are indeed questions and I think that Emer, um, it's probably over to you to, 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 to read them out, but that's all I wanted to say from my end. Um, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank is right. Thank you so much. Well, that was really informative. Thank you very, very much. And we do have an awful lot of questions coming through. Uh, I'm going to put out here in the, the chat function for everyone to see. This is a link to our brochure, which is a lovely, easy read online. So you can figure out the very different many ways to study German and indeed French across our three main courses, BA Joint Honours, BA Modern Languages and BA Humanities. So I think it's worth having a, a flick and a scroll through that. Um, uh, and get familiar with the various different ways that you can study, the opportunities to study abroad, the opportunities for internships, and so on. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to add, Siobhan or Stephen, before we move on to Italia and Ursula Fanning? I, I see that there's a couple of questions there. Will I answer those now? Um, I can answer those very briefly if you want. Is the Reichstag publicly owned? Do you know? I don't know that. But I'm assuming it's owned by the German state. Um, so. Uh, Right, okay, so that answers that question. Are many all lectures taught through the language being studied? That's a really good question. The language classes are all taught through German. Um, when we have lectures, um, as in where a bit like what I'm doing now, so I'm speaking to you and you're listening and there isn't unfortunately much room for, for interaction, they would be in German typically, but we would have plenty slides and you'd be able to, to access those. You can take German module as an elective if you haven't done German, absolutely. So you come in, you do beginner's German and you can work your way through it and do that through all the, the um, your, your degree. Um, and there's one other one, the class size for languages um, are small. That's the good news. Okay, so typically in a language class, a German language class, we would have roughly 15 to 20, maybe smaller in a group. The lectures, the seminars could be bigger. They could have anything from 20 up to 50, depending on the size of the group. Okay. You're muted, Emer. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Okay, right. Thank you for coming along and uh, for sharing all that information with our students. And I do encourage again students to stay in touch with us um, through hello.artshumanities. And I'll put that in the text box. If you have any questions or queries, we're here to help you. And you can indeed contact lecturers directly as well if you have any specific queries about the subject. So thanks again, Siobhan, for joining us. Okay, Wiedersehen, danke, tschüss. <laughs> it's a whirlwind tour around Europe and the world. And next up is Ursula Fanning, who is the head of Italian studies at UCD. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ursula. Thank you, Ursula, for joining us on this beautiful sunny Hello, Imer. Hello, everybody. Ciao a tutti e benvenuti al Taster Italiano. So a very warm welcome to the Italian Taster in the School of Languages, Linguistics and Cultures at UCD. As Imer said, my name is Ursula Fanning and I'm one of the lecturers in Italian. As a matter of fact, thinking about this, I realised that, as I thought about it, I'm the only non-Italian member of staff in Italian. So from that, you can work out already that you would have extensive uh, access to native speakers and really excellent opportunities to either learn Italian from scratch or to improve your language skills uh, with that access to native speakers. So that's, that's a real bonus. Um, 
if this were a, a taster in real life as opposed to a virtual taster, there would be at least two things that would be different. Um, I would make sure I had nibbles of bruschetta and crostini for, the, for you so that you could actually taste some of the wonderful Italian food that I know you're probably all familiar with. And also I would offer you a mini lecture on the Futurist Cookbook, which fits the taster theme and is also the kind of thing that, that we look at uh, in first year Italian in particular. But as things stand, we're doing things virtually, obviously. So I plan really to structure today's session very much as an information session with a brief introduction of what we offer in first year, since that's what's most immediately relevant to all of you. And then I want to show you a short video clip which gives you a really good sense, I think, of what it's like to be a student of Italian and of where that experience can take you. And I do mean that literally. Um, I'll say a few words then about what we offer after first year. And finally, we have a brief Q&A specifically on Italian so that you can ask any questions that you're keen to ask that I haven't covered in my presentation. So for that, you would use the Q&A box, uh, which is on the bottom of your screen. I'll start off though by addressing the question that prospective students most often ask when they're thinking about studying Italian. And that is, do I have to have done Italian already for the Leaving Cert or for whatever the Leaving Cert equivalent is, depending on which educational system you've come from? And the answer to that is that a good 80 to 90% of our students in any given year are complete beginners. And that's a fact that absolutely does not hold them back relative to people who have studied Italian in school, who have acquired Italian by spending time there, or who might be heritage speakers of Italian from Italian families. And we have a lot of students in those particular groups as well. So yes, uh, you'll be in a majority if you choose to study Italian from scratch, but you can also study Italian as an on the game. And I think the most important factors in terms of how well you do in a new language when you take it up at university level um, are probably how interested you are in language learning generally and in the country in particular. How prepared you are to work at it and how prepared you are to give yourself opportunities to use it. And of course, that involves time spent in Italy. We're not going to be in lockdown forever. We will get a chance to go to Italy and to experience Italy. Uh, at some point if you haven't done so already. So first of all, on to what we offer students of Italian at first year level. We offer beginners Italian language in trimester one in small groups. Typically those groups would be somewhere between 15 and 20 students in size, maybe smaller. So in that small class environment, you really do get to know each other pretty quickly and pretty well. And it's also optimal really for language learning and certainly for getting close individual attention from your tutors. Uh, we expect also that there will be enough uh, non-beginners, so people who are not starting Italian from scratch, to offer a separate class for those students, there usually is. And we've been working through the same programme but at a faster pace uh, that would suit you if you're a non-beginner and you want to do Italian in the first trimester. If you are, for example, a BA in Modern Languages student or a Commerce International student, you would have to do an Italian module in first trimester, an Italian language module in first trimester anyway. In trimester two, we offer a culture module for first years. And as you'll see in the video clip that I'm going to show you shortly, culture is a hugely important part of the Italian studies program. In other words, we don't just do language. Um, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why the GIF on the Padlet for today is non-language based. You've got a sort of hand going like this at you. And that's one of the classic gestures really in Italian. There are lots of other ways of communicating apart from the linguistic. Gestures are one, and these are critical for Italians, as many of you probably know. Culture in its broadest sense is another. And in fact, we've had employers contacting us over the years to tell us that it's actually very important to them that our graduates have done literary and cultural courses, as well as being proficient in the language. Because what it means is that they totally get the cultural and social context in Italy, whether they're working for Italian companies, with Italian clients, or in Italy itself. And so the culture module that we offer to first year students in trimester two, Making Italy, 
is very much an introduction to Italian culture and a way of kind of dipping your toes into the Italian culture of water. So that covers the development of the Italian language. Some early Italian literature, you think the big names like Dante, Boccaccio, Machiavelli. And we also look at significant moments in Italian history, for instance, unification, fascism. And we offer a brief introduction to modern Italian literature. And all of those elements are built on in later years, and they're taught by people who have research specialisations in those specific areas. So in trimester two, you would have that culture module, and we also offer two language modules for first year students. One for those of you who were non-beginners at the start of the academic year, and the other one for those who were beginners in trimester one, but who now aren't beginners anymore. So that's all I want to say about first year just for the moment, and I'm now going to play that short video clip for you so that you can hear some of the views of students who have studied Italian. This clip is called Choose Italian, and you'll actually find it on YouTube. You'll find the whole thing on YouTube. It's about 20 minutes long in total. And uh, I really do encourage you to watch it all because the enthusiasm of the students and the information that they give you about being a student studying Italian is, is really kind of tangible. You can, it jumps off the video, you can really feel it. The video was made by the British and Irish Society for Italian Studies. So many of the students are actually from the UK, but there's also one of our own UCD graduates here, and you'll hear and see him quite early on in the clip. So I'm just going to play about three minutes of this, and then I'll come back to talk to you a little bit more about the, the rest of the Italian course. So bear with me just for a moment while I share my screen with you and get this kicked off. Just being up the document in there. Italian is something that not many other people have, and as far as life experience is concerned, it's fantastic. Literature, ancient history, all these elements are as much a part of learning a language as learning a grammar. I'm 20 years old and I'm living in the south of Italy on the coast. I don't think any other degree would have given me this opportunity. It's a country with 60 million people in it. It has one of the 10 economies in the world, you know, a massive domestic market. It gives you the option to go into lots of fields and lots of different choices of work. Studying Italian, personally, was one of the best decisions I've ever made. It just gives you something you don't get in a normal university course. You have to do it. Learn Italian. You're never going to regret it. One of the main things you've got to be prepared to do if you want to learn a language and take it to the level where you want to become fluent in it, you have to be prepared to immerse yourself in the culture and the language of that country. Generally, the third year is compulsory spend a year abroad. I chose to do an Erasmus year. It's meant a placement in the university here in Florence. I knew that this was going to be somewhere where I would be constantly entertained and there'd always be something for me to explore. Do you call them, text them or WhatsApp? I'm doing a teaching assistant programme, so I'm here in this town just to the south of Naples and there's a huge market street. You're just having a, having a bit of a browse. If someone's leapt in and they're explaining to you what it is, where it's from, and they're really passionate about it. At university, the way languages are taught makes it so easy to pick up a language and really run with it. It's the rate that you learn the language which really amazed me. Ask me questions in Italian. Have you studied when you were at home? Have you studied when you were at home? Have you studied with your Sono venuto qui a casa mia. I'm actually working at a five-star hotel. 
which is about half an hour north of Milan, right near the Swiss border. We get lots of politicians come here for business. And last year, we did a whole module on Italian politics. So it's brilliant to see it actually in action and the reason why they're here and what they're doing. You feel like you're in a film. Okay, so can you hear me again? Everything okay there, yeah. So you'll have seen from that clip uh, a little bit about the, uh, the, the reactions that students have to studying Italian, the opportunities that they get when they study Italian. You'll also have seen how important the gestures are. You'll have seen the Italian students making gestures there and also the, the students who are studying Italian picked up the Italian gestures as well as a, as a way of communicating, underlining their communication. So all of that is, is, uh, is enthusing, I think. It makes me want to go to Italy immediately. You can't at the moment, of course, but that, that won't last, uh, hopefully, too much longer. Um, so I want to come back to, to our curriculum and uh, to the various things that you can do after first year. Uh, a quick snapshot, I suppose, really, of the other modules that we're offering at the moment. These can change a little bit uh, from year to year, depending on when somebody wants to introduce something new. But they're all taught in a combination of weekly lectures and weekly tutorials or seminars. And at present, we're offering second year students, uh, obviously, a language module in each trimester. That happens all of the time, all of the way through language is core. And we also offer a language based module in how to read Italian literature, another module on Pedro and Boccaccio, one on Italian cinema, and one on Italian short stories from Boccaccio to the 21st century. So language, reading Italian literature, Petrarch and Boccaccio, cinema and short stories. And you'll have heard the students talking uh, in that video clip as well about how important the culture is and how important the access to the culture is for understanding the country and for understanding people as well. And that understanding obviously helps the process of communication, which is facilitated clearly by the language modules in the first instance. Third year students at present have their core language modules, their two language modules, one in each trimester. They also have a course on contemporary Italian women writers, on 20th century poetry between the two world wars, on Renaissance Italy, on the history of the Italian language, and they also have the possibility of doing a research module in an area which they choose, which they're particularly interested in. And then Erasmus was mentioned in that video clip as well. So in between second and final year, lots of students choose to go abroad. And for some students on some programs, that's actually an integral and compulsory part of the course. So if you're, uh, again, a Commerce International student or a BA in Modern Languages student, then you will have to spend a year abroad. Uh, apart from that, several of the students doing the, if you like, the two-subject BA, the regular BA, choose to turn it into a BA International by spending a year abroad. And then other students take a year out and go independently to Italy. So whatever path you choose, I really can't underline enough the importance of that time abroad, being in another culture, speaking another language. It's not just good for your degree, it's not just good for your academically, it's really transformative for you as a person. And you'll be hearing more about that in the session on Erasmus later on. Um, we notice the student who comes back after a year abroad is not the same person who went out. And I think the extraordinary thing about learning another language to a high level and about interacting with its culture is that you actually get to acquire a whole new identity and you discover that you can be a different person uh, in a different cultural and linguistic context. So I think that's about all of the overview that I wanted to give you. So I'll pass over to, to you now if you have any questions. Um, there, there's a Q&A function at the bottom which you can use and uh, I'll just pass over to you here as well to, to pick up there and perhaps to, to deal with some of those, to read those out. Thank you so much, Ursula. Not at all. Yeah, I feel like I've been to Italy and back. <laughs> Good, okay. <laughs> Very nice to um, escape the, the slight chill that's coming in the air over here in Dublin. I know, absolutely. To see the warmth and the sunshine is, is great. I know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the first question there about the structured elective was probably for Siobhan, and I think she dealt with that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that is correct. Can you see yeah. that question about, uh, would you be fluent after studying Italian at UCD? Yeah, I mean, that, that is really, it depends on you to a large extent, um, in the sense that it depends on, 
on how much effort you put into your coursework. I think the time abroad is probably the really, really crucial factor there. If you want fluency, you need to spend time abroad. And that's the case studying any language, it's not just Italian. Um, but if you spend your year abroad initially, our students come back pretty much fluent, certainly, and build on that fluency in the final year. I guess it depends again on whether you're a beginner or a non-beginner, on whether you have family connections with it or not. Um, because clearly, uh, if you're a non-beginner, you may acquire that fluency a little bit faster, uh, even while you're in the process of your first two years, maybe again going backwards and forwards to Italy. And if you have family connections, you, you possibly already fluent. Um, but uh, certainly, if you're if you're spending your time uh, studying Italian and if you spend time in the country. Uh, a, a considerable chunk of time a year, I think, is ideal. Um, then fluency is, is, is pretty much guaranteed, absolutely, yeah. Um, if the next question was, I think, if you're doing a different degree, would you be able to access more than one language module for UCD Horizons? Um, Imer, do you have any information on that um, from an administrative point of view? I'm not sure. Oh, I can't hear you. You're on mute. No. You can study a range of subjects through yeah. the horizon. So I'll put a link in that box so those people can explore mm -hmm. the options that are available to them. But yes, you can study languages as part of horizons. Yes, yeah, absolutely right. Um, it's the more than one language module, I think, is what students were, were concerned with there. But yes, I think that's the case. I think you can. Yeah. And yes, you can take several. Yeah. Um, and the next question was, is there an Italian club in UCD? There's the Italian Society in UCD and we certainly encourage students to get involved in that. And they've done a lot of interesting things over the years. They've done obviously skiing trips to Italy and so on. Um, they have regular get-togethers, regular coffee mornings. Um, we have guest speakers. We actually have a program of speakers uh, who come and talk to us um, in Italian. And um, I don't mean, sorry, not necessarily in the Italian language, but in, in Italian speakers to talk about um, matters Italian, if you like, that, that really can be very, very wide ranging. Um, apart from that, um, uh, we have links with the Italian Institute, the Italian Cultural Institute, and they, they're they extremely active. They're in the centre of Dublin, North Italian Square, and they're extremely active. Uh, they organize three, four events a week, and we encourage our students to go along to those. And also, there you get to meet the Italian community um, because they attend these as well. And uh, they, they cover a huge range of topics and, and interests. And we always let our students know what's going on in terms of the Italian Institute. But yes, the Italian Society also exists. Okay, the next question was, if, would you be up to scratch in third year if you were going to Italy and you only started learning the language in first year? Absolutely. You have your, your grammar basis there. Um, you've had conversation classes during the course of the two years. I think always moving to a new country is a little bit of a shock to the system. Students always find it a little bit difficult to start off with. Um, but you would be able to cope and clearly, you know, at the end of the month, you're able to cope better than you were at the start of that month when you went out. And that just grows exponentially as you spend time in the country. So that by the end, by the end, people are distraught to me, in my experience. You know, the thought of coming back to Ireland and leaving the team is, uh, is uh, really, really difficult for them. Uh, so uh, it, it, many of our students will say, you know, the first thing they want to do when they finish their degree is get straight back to Italy. So, uh, yeah. But yes, you, you, would be, you would be well able for it. You would be well ready for it, yeah. Okay. That's great. I see another question there. Are the lectures in English or Italian? Okay, so our lectures, yes, there is another question. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, when you go to Italy in third year, are the lectures in Italian or English? When you go to Italy in third year, your lectures are in Italian. Okay. And uh, the idea is that you do courses in Italian. There may well be some courses in the university that you go to that will be offered in English, but we strongly encourage even possibly compel students to take courses in Italian because it's that exposure that makes the difference in terms of your own fluency. You really need that exposure. Um, in terms of our own courses here, our courses are told, our content courses, if you like, our literature courses, um, our non language courses generally uh, are taught in English um, with a little bit of Italian interspersed gradually as students move their way through. To higher levels but the vast majority of our students are actually complete beginners so we don't from the very beginning teach in or through Italian uh, except in language classes we move in language classes quite quickly 
into uh, an almost entirely Italian experience with explanations in English, obviously, where students need them. Okay. Do you get support in Italy? Um, in the same way that other students do, in the sense that there, there is uh, an, an Erasmus office uh, in the Italian university, and if you have particular problems, you can, uh, you can liaise with those. And I mean, there are also people here who will support you as well. So for instance, um, I coordinate Erasmus uh, for our students abroad. So I'm always at the end of an email, and certainly the people in the international office are always at the end of an email as well, if, if you need support, certainly. After completing your time studying in university, studying Italian, would you be fluent? If you spend time in the country, absolutely. Um, if, you, if you're confining yourself simply to Italian classes, uh, you know, going what, three times a week to an Italian class and then your content courses and so on, you don't acquire that fluency. You need to live in the country uh, for a period of time to acquire that kind of fluency. Um, if you're doing, so you said, there's another question there that seems to have gone, actually. Mm -hmm. We've had a few yeah. questions come through about um, the different universities in, in Italy where there are Erasmus programmes. Can you give yeah. us the range of universities? Yeah, here? sure, absolutely. Um, we have links uh, with Roma Play in Rome, obviously. Um, we have links uh, with uh, Urbino, we have links with Cagliari, um, we have links with, again, it depends on what program students are doing here. For the business students, for instance, uh, we have links in Milan. Um, there are links, uh, yeah, clearly, as I said, in Rome. Um, we have about eight links and more opening up at the moment. So at the moment, we're able to accommodate students who want to go uh, on exchange and do Erasmus in Italy without any problem. Uh, and we're actually expanding our links at the moment. That's fantastic. And any recommended reading or films or books or magazines for people to just get up to get a little bit of speed going on their Italian? On their Italian, yeah. I mean, well, the, I suppose the point is that the vast majority of our students really coming in are beginners. So the vast majority of our students when they come in don't have Italian. But there's always a core group that have Italian for a number of reasons really. There can be heritage speakers, so people who speak Italian at home, or people who studied Italian in school to different levels, obviously. Some people who have done Italian, maybe to junior, sorry, some people who have done Italian in their transition year, some people who have done Italian right up to leaving cert. So, uh, so there's a range of, of people who have ability. So it really depends on, on where your, your own starting ability is, I suppose, uh, effectively. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would recommend, uh, gosh, there's so many wonderful Italian films. Uh, I guess I guess something like Fellini's La Voce Vita is, is something that lots of people uh, gravitate towards. And certainly if you've got an interest in Rome, uh, La Voce Vita is fabulous. There's a lot of, uh, obviously, more recent films. Nanni Moretti's films generally uh, are, are wonderful. Um, uh, La Grande Bellezza by Paolo Sorrentino. Um, Il Postino is one of my, my favorite, kind of slightly sentimental, romantic uh, Italian films, but it's absolutely wonderful. Um, Giuseppe Tornatore. Um, so there's, there's a lot of absolutely wonderful uh, Italian movies out there that you can access uh, that will just whet your appetite. And don't forget to watch the, uh, the uh, Choose Italian video as well, because you get more, more feedback from students who've had the experience. Il Postino, thank you, Manu. Yes, Il Postino is one of my favorite films as well. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, um, La Melio Gioventù is a fantastic film as well. It's very, very long, um, but it's a, it's a great movie. Uh, so Paolo Sorrentino's films are, are really, really very, very impressive, I think, generally. Loads, there's loads out there. So, uh, so dip your toe in the water and uh, think, think about doing Italian, absolutely. That's greater. So I see here, do you get to choose what university to go on for Erasmus year? Um, you are allowed to create a, a list of choices and in fact the choices are allocated depending on how people have done in their exams uh, in first and second year. So it's worthwhile looking down from the very beginning and uh, engaging in the associate course uh, because you're more likely to get your top choice then. Okay. But people in practice, you know, people sometimes think that they really want to go to a particular place and they end up somewhere else and they still have a wonderful time. You know, it's Italy. What can I say? <laughs> That's great. Another question coming in. Do you recommend 
Duolingo for learning languages? Well, yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a good starting point, I suppose, really. Um, it's, uh, it, it certainly helps you to dip your toe in the water. We have quite a structured approach to the teaching of the language uh, in Italian. So we're, we're very keen to get people off the, from the, the, the grammatical starting blocks, if you, write, if you like, at a very early stage. So uh, I, I would say, by all means, expose yourself to the, to the language as much as you possibly can, both through film and through the language courses, if you want to do that. Uh, but you get a very, very good grounding and a very solid grammatical grounding uh, when you come to do Italian in the city, if you're doing it from scratch. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for taking us through what it's like to study Italian at UCD and for giving us such an insight into Italian culture. Really useful and for answering all those questions. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Okay, di niente. <laughs> we're going to move on very soon. Um, we're going to be joined shortly by Tara, who is the uh, lecturer in Spanish, who's going to give the next Taster workshop. She'll be joining us in a couple of minutes' time. Just wonder if there's any other questions that people would like to send through. Now is a good time. Keep the chat box running. It's great to hear from all of you. Stephen, you might like to come in there. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm looking through some of these questions. A lot of them um, re relating to linguistics uh, have to do with uh, jobs. And um, obviously, this is something that comes up a lot, uh, oftentimes, because um, we're all worried about having jobs when we finish our degrees, for sure. Um, and in the current climate, it's not uh, at all uh, beyond the pale to be asking, you know, what is the uh, the usefulness of my degree? Um, if you do a Google or you you search on any job uh, website, type in the word linguist, and oftentimes it will be combined with another language. So it could be uh, Italian, Fr French, Spanish, German, um, or a lot of heritage languages like Polish or Lithuanian. Uh, Brazilian Portuguese. Um, there are an awful lot of jobs out there, especially in Dublin, uh, that want people who are fluent in another language other than English with very high levels of English co uh, competency. Mm -hmm. um, and all of our degrees kind of prepare you for that sort of thing. They, we're preparing you for, um, you know, giving you analytical skills, research skills, um, a lot of uh, new, newer tech ter tech firms, like uh, this company called Data Miner, who are always looking for linguists. Um, they're always looking for people with uh, other languages. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn, these people are always looking for people with Italian, Spanish, French, English, German, and all these uh, different um, uh, heritage languages. And uh, another area where a lot of people are going to after our degree uh, is into teaching. So secondary school teaching, uh, you are in some ways prepared, obviously doing an Italian degree, uh, doing a French degree, you're, you're prepared to teach those subjects uh, at that level, at secondary school level. Um, and you'll also be able to uh, then do your, uh, your transition, your uh, postgrad course um, in order to um, uh, to be qualified there. Uh, then, of course, if you wanted to stay on and do a master's and a PhD with us, uh, then you'll you'll be able to uh, teach in universities, uh, and that's that's where the real fun begins. So true. I've just put there in the text box a link to all the information we have on the wide range of careers across many sectors where our graduates go on to work. And there's also pages that showcase some stories of people, what they studied, what they went on to do, uh, if going straight into work or doing postgraduate after their uh, BA. So it'd be really interesting to have a little flick through that and, and get behind those stories and understand the different journeys that people experience after they study linguistics or languages at UCD. Um, so that might help you figure out, well, what's the kind of place I would like to work? What's the kind of job that I would like to do? And that will really help inspire you make um, the right choice for you. Um, we are running so on time, guys. This is incredible.
Tara has joined us. She's next up from the Spanish department. Tara, can you hear us? Hi, Amber. Yes, sorry. Uh, my internet decided to crash out just at the moment. <laughs> you were saying that. You're not alone. It happens to all of us. It's great to see you. Oh, you can see me now. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, You're very welcome. We've just uh, had our linguistics, French and German lecture, as you know, and now we're taking you to Spain, to Mexico and beyond. So delighted to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us to give this tester, taster lecture. And I'll hand over to you without further ado. Okay, brilliant. So thanks very much, Emer. Um, I managed to catch the tail end of Ursula's talk and also what Stephen was saying there about um, careers in linguistics. Um, obviously, when we've done this in years past, uh, we've given little taster samples of the kind of classes that we might offer. Um, this time last year, my colleague Mariana actually gave a cookery class, um, which was wonderful. She sent me photographs of it because I was in Mexico at the time. Um, so even though we can't give you a taster lecture, what I'd like to do is just introduce you to who we are in the department, the kind of courses that you might expect and what your experience might be like at UCD. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll share my screen and put on a PowerPoint presentation because then sometimes I think it helps when you can see the structure visually. I'll introduce you to who we are um, and to what we do. So just give me one wee second. Yeah, here we are. And I'm going to start from the beginning. Okay, um, so in the first slide, quienes somos, pues me gustaría presentarme. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tara Plunkett. I'm the current head of Spanish and Portuguese studies, which is an honor that I'm about to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Pascal Picker. Um, there are a few of us in the subject, as you can see. Uh, what we try to do is to um, have a coverage of uh, experts on Spain and on Latin America. Um, so when you're thinking about what's really different between studying Spanish at school and studying Spanish at university, um, the education is being brought to you by a group of people who have specialised in really specific subject areas. Um, unlike studying Spanish at school, we are the ones who've created the curriculum. And when it comes to literature and culture courses, we have created those courses based on our areas of interest. Um, so like Ursula was saying with Italian, Spanish is open to everyone. So many of you out there may have a level of Spanish already. You may have studied Spanish for leaving certificate, but perhaps Spanish is a language that you haven't studied before. Um, in either case, we are open for you. Um, and we give you two separate streams. So what I've shown you here on the first slide is that you can either join Spanish as a beginner um, or Spanish as a non-beginner, and they're kept separate in the first year. Um, I've given you just some images there so you'll know who you might expect to meet. Um, then in level two, uh, we still have those two strands separated for the first semester, and then they're all brought together in level three. Um, so in Spanish, it's not just about the applied learning of a language. What's really important for us is um, it's not just about being able to converse to people in Spain and Latin America. What we really want to create in our graduates is people who have something interesting to say. Um, so our language courses are combined with courses on literature and culture. Um, so I'll just talk you through the language first at level one. Um, the beginner Spanish and the non-beginner Spanish are taught slightly differently. Um, the beginners have three hours of timetable sessions a week, just because they need a wee bit of extra time. Um, they do work from a textbook because when you're starting a language from scratch, you'll find it's really fun and interactive. You'll find those groups get to know each other very quickly because they're all in the same boat starting from the beginning. They can tend to be more lighthearted, those sessions, you know, especially when you're starting from scratch with the alphabet. But also it is quite an intensive course. Um, it is very possible to start as a beginner in Spanish at level one. And by the end of the degree, we cannot tell quite often the beginners from the non-beginners. Um, the beginners use a textbook to begin with. Um, and those sessions are very communi communicative and very interactive. We tend to use Spanish as a majority in the classroom, English only as a last resort. Um, the non-beginner Spanish then is slightly different. Those students have two hours a week. Um, 
rather than being based on a textbook, what we have tried to do is to gather together a group of materials that will really help you um, in your uh, independent learning of the language. Um, that's another main difference between learning a language at university and learning a language at school is that there's a great emphasis placed on your independent study. Um, so when it comes to how we've created that course, what we have tried to do um, is to create a, a body of materials that will help you to find areas of interest that are really within your own interests in order for you to study Spanish independently. So in that course, of course, we have a basis of grammar because it's really important that you can actually construct a sentence uh, and string your sentences together. Um, but also when it comes to the kind of topics that you cover in the first semester of level one, we have tried to include a range of interests to help you uh, find sources that you can use on your own. Um, so in that first semester, we look at um, cinema, literature, um, we look at a fashion blogger, um, we see videos from a prominent chef in Spain, because we're aware that we have this diverse student body, everybody has completely different interests, um, and we are most likely to do well and to study independently when we find something we're really interested in. So in that first semester, we try to show you videos of real content on topics that we hope you'll be interested in. Um, and also I think it's really important to give you those videos of real content because it is good to have textbook videos, um, you know, videos that are specifically crafted for language learners. But what you'll find when you hopefully go to Spain and Latin America is that people don't speak slowly just so that you will understand them. Um, so that's why we try to expose our students to realistic content created by real people, usually around about their age, so that they can engage on their own. Um, in the second semester of Level 1 Spanish Non-Beginners, that's when we start to integrate a bit more of the cultural content um, into the language courses. So we start thinking about wider issues in Spain and in Latin America. Um, we start off by looking at the independence question in Catalonia. Um, about the different cultures in the Basque country. And then we sort of take you on a trip through Latin America because let's not forget, Spanish is a beautiful language in that it can open the doors for you, not only to Spain, but to all these countries in Latin America. So again, we tried to pick out things that we thought you'd find interesting. So when we go to Guatemala, we look at Mashimon, who is the patron saint of rogues and rascals. Um, we learn about how people bring him offerings of rum and they smoke cigars in order to uh, either get him to help them fall in love or to smite their enemies. Um, we look at different elements of Mexican culture. We see some documentary footage of the Day of the Dead and we learn about the different altars. Um, and when we pass by Argentina, we look at tango and how tango isn't just a dance form, but it, the lyrics are also revolutionary. Um, so that's just a taster of what's in the language courses. We haven't even come to the cultural content um, that you can expect at level one. Um, so there's, that's a wee image of Mashi Mon there, just so you can see that deity. Um, in level one, we have modules what, that we call content modules. So these are literature and culture modules that are there to intensify your language learning. We have a really interesting one in the first semester called An Introduction to Hispanic Cultures and Societies. Again, this is because we think it's really important that when you go to Spain or to Latin America, that you know about the culture and society of the countries that you're visiting. So that one's very focused on current events and on the recent history. You know, I think it's really important if you go to Spain today to know about the history of the Spanish Civil War to know that young people your age grew up under dictatorship, to know that Franco hadn't died until 1975. Um, I've been lecturing on that course for the past few years and it's interesting every year that changes. You know, maybe five years ago, we were thinking about this rise of the Occupy movement, um, mass demonstrations and how they affected the Spanish political landscape. Every year that situation continues to evolve. So students find that one really interesting because they want to know more about um, the countries that they're learning about. And we use this interesting problem-based learning where we give students a problem that they have to solve in groups. One example of this um, off the top of my head was we showed them the film Todo Sobre Mi Madre by Pedro Almodóvar. 
And the problem we gave was that parents had written in to ask that it be removed from the curriculum because it deals with um, issues such as transgender identities, HIV AIDS, and the students in their groups had to make a decision as a collective. Did they want to keep the film on the curriculum? Did they want to remove it from the curriculum? And then they had to write a detailed letter explaining why they had arrived at that decision. Um, so I think that module is really interesting for first years. It helps first years to get to know one another, but also to think about the wider resonances of what we're doing. Um, the second semester then we have this module called Reading Hispanic Texts in which you get a glimpse of the literary interests of all the colleagues um, in the department. Not all the colleagues every year, but we try to give you an equal weighting of literature from Spain, literature from Latin America, and then different types of literature. We start off with poetry, we look at short stories, then we think about theatre, and quite often we'll think about a novel. Um, I think that course is really important because quite often when we start studying a language at university, we don't really know what it is that we love. Um, we haven't found it yet. And that's why it's so important that we show you the research that our colleagues are interested in. They have spent years of their lives dedicated to the study of Spanish Peninsular poetry or of Latin American literature. So in that module, then we give you a taster. You can feed from their enthusiasm for that and figure out what it is that you would really like to do. Um, you'll notice in the first year, it's set out for you. But then after that, um, you can chart your own course. Um, I'm aware I've already been speaking for 10 minutes, so I won't go in depth into all of these modules. But what I will say is that each of these modules is the product of someone's labor of love. These are our research interests and we've crystallized those into courses for you. Um, what we try to do is to give you a variety of different types of genre. So you'll see you've got poetry, you have theatre, you have novels. Um, we also have visual culture, so you've got one on cinema. Um, Pascal's Latin American culture looks at different types of visual and textual culture. Um, Latin American detective fiction. At level three, we have a similar array. You'll notice some fine art in there as well with my module on surrealism in Spain and Mexico. So what we really want for you is to be able to chart your own course to figure out what is it that I'm really interested in. Do I prefer poetry and shorter pieces of text? Am I really interested in seeing the Spanish language come to life on the stage? Um, am I focused on Spain because that's where I see myself in the future? Or would I like to um, broaden my horizons and, and trace a path through Latin America? Um, so that's how we have divided up those courses and more or less a selection like that will be available um, every year. So I suppose the big question everybody wants to ask is options for the year abroad. Um, we are hugely in favour of the extent to which um, a year abroad can crystallise your language learning. Um, I had my 21st birthday in Leon in Spain and that was one of the best years of my life. Um, I imagine I'll get more questions on that in the Q&A but just to say there are many different ways that you can take a year abroad. Obviously, in the current situation, um, you might be hesitant about that, but Spain and Latin America will always be there, regardless of how you choose to approach them. You might want to be an Erasmus student. You might choose to go on Erasmus in Spain. You might already, at the degree stage, be feeling quite adventurous and want to take a, uh, an Erasmus option in Latin America, which we would certainly encourage you to do. Um, you'll see there, I've also got the title Auxiliares de Conversación, and that's a classroom assistantship scheme, which is run by the Spanish government. That one's really good as well, because like Stephen was saying just before I came in, many of our students want to go on to teach. So what you can do is pause your degree for a year, not pay fees for that year, um, go and work as a classroom assistant in a Spanish uh, school, and that's organised by our contacts in the Spanish government. That's a scheme that we trust. Um, and so then you get a different experience. You're having an experience as someone who's a professional as opposed to the experience of a student. Um, but regardless of whether you choose to go on a year abroad during the degree or um, how you choose to do that, once you've finished a degree in Spanish, really our aim is to get you up to a near native level of fluency, but with a fantastic breadth of knowledge about Spanish and Latin American culture. Um, and once that degree is over, you know, we have opened those doors for you for to go all around the world. 
as I said, I wasn't at the summer school this time last year because I was in Mexico uh, towards the end of my sabbatical. Um, about this time last year, I was walking through uh, the Zócalo in Oaxaca, down at the south of Mexico. Um, and I hadn't seen another person that I recognized in about two months, I would say. And I heard my name shouted across the Zócalo. Um, and to my surprise, it was three students who I just taught the semester before. Um, they were commerce students. They had all gone to Spain on their year abroad, but decided to take the summer immediately after they graduated to travel through Mexico and Guatemala. And we just happened to bump into each other in the Socalo. So it was in that moment when I could see, really, this is why we're doing what we're doing. We want to sort of light a spark under you, um, get you interested in the things that are our life's passions, and then equip you with the skills to travel, to, to live and uh, life and love in Spain or in Latin America as well. Um, so that's 15 minutes and um, I'll just stop sharing my screen here so I can go back in. Um, oh, I can see you more. <laughs> it was a brilliant lecture. Thank you so much. And I'm having visions of you in the Sopalo in Oaxaca, a great part of the world, bumping into people. As they say in Spanish, el mundo es un panuelo. Such a small exactly. word. And also my name sounds like so many words in, Sp in Spanish and I had been on my own for so long that I really thought I was imagining it until they actually properly flagged me down. I think we were all quite shocked at that because obviously they had no idea I was there. And I That's had no idea they, was there. they were there. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. Thank you so much. What a great lecture and a, a great insight into the kinds of research areas that you cover in Spanish, uh, so really exciting to see in such a diverse and, and modern course. It's absolutely fantastic. And um, so we've had a few questions in. I don't know if you can see them there. I can read them out and you can answer if you want. We can do it that way. Or if you want to read and answer, it's up to you. Um, on the Q&A one or the chat one? It's on the Q&A. Oh, OK. Um, is Spanish music covered in Spanish culture? We don't have a module dedicated to Spanish music. Um, on the Hispanic cultures and societies, we had actually looked at punk music that emerged after the dictatorship. Um, and I recently supervised a PhD thesis that looked at the influence of um, jazz poetry or jazz music on poetry of Spain and Latin America. Um, so, and we do also cover it to a certain extent in the language classes. Um, we don't have a specific module on that, but I mean, that is something that's a really interesting idea. So, you know, I would certainly think of how we could integrate that. And also my colleague, Mary Farley, does some really interesting work on modern Spanish theatre. So if you're interested in music and performance, you might find certain modules that even if they don't exactly match up to your, your area of interest, that they might be parallel to it. Um, is there a Latino Hispanic Society in UCD? Yes, there is a huge Hispanic Society in UCD. Um, they are very autonomous. They're very well organized um, and they're brilliant. They organize uh, certain events like margarita evenings, but they also organize trips um, to Barcelona. Um, and the good thing about the Erasmus scheme is that we receive the same amount of students as we send abroad. So what we try to do is to introduce the incoming Spanish and Latin American Erasmus students to the Hispanic society in order that um, everyone can intermingle. So we certainly, um, we certainly encourage our students um, to, to join the Spanish society. Do we learn Catalan Spanish or South American Spanish or a mix of both in UCD? Um, so I take it you mean Castilian Spanish from Peninsular Spain or Latin American Spanish and um, there is a mixture. Um, I think it's really important that students are exposed to the many different ways to speak lang uh, Spanish language because even if you spend a year in Spain you will certainly meet lots of Latin Americans. Um, so I think at the moment we have quite a good balance between the two um, and what we try to do in first year is to get the lecturers to introduce themselves and to explain exactly where their accent emerges from so that students know what to listen out for. Um, and that's also why we like to use videos with natural speech um, so that you can become accustomed to the different accents. But also the YouTube videos have the wonderful facility where you can slow down the speed um, so you can really then get to grips with the accent and you can watch videos over and over again to just sort of help you to distinguish between the accents. 
Um, do you have a reading list? We have reading lists for all of our modules um, on the website. Um, I can double check to make sure that you have access to those, but there is a system online whereby uh, lecturers can upload a reading list for all of those content modules. Um, so I don't know if that's specifically on the literature modules, but yes, we do. Um, in third year, can you go to South America? So the year abroad tends to happen after you've studied at ECD for two years. And yes, you can most certainly go to South America. At present, we have links in Santiago, in Chile, in um, Argentina, just outside of Buenos Aires, in Montevideo, in Uruguay, and in Querétaro, in Mexico. Um, we certainly do encourage our students to take the opportunity to go to Latin America if they feel that they're ready for that journey. Um, also, you often find, particularly with our uh, connections in Uruguay and Mexico, because we send over such a small bunch of students, they're generally very well looked after. Um, and there's lots of us who've spent a lot of time in Latin America as well who can guide you before then. Um, so yes, that is certainly uh, something that we would encourage you to do if, if you're interested. Um, okay, that's great, Tara. Thank you so much. And I'm going to put the uh, school website in the text box so people can get familiar with all the resources that are available uh, on the, on the uh, school website, which is regularly updated. And you can also follow the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics on Twitter uh, and on Facebook as well. Well worth a look to get a flavour of what's happening within the school and the variety of different events that are happening and any, core, any developments in courses. So thank you so much for joining us, Tara. Thank you. Um, Great to see you. Yes, you too. I'm sorry for talking a mile a minute. I get really excited when I talk about Spanish. <laughs> that, was, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And without further ado, if it's okay with you, I'm going to bring in Derval Conroy, who is going to speak about literatures. So welcome, Derval. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Emer. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Derval Conroy. Before I uh, share my screen, I hope you can all see me. Um, so let me, sorry, let me just check that you all, uh, sorry, share screen. We can so, definitely hear you. Oh yeah, there we go. There we go. Sorry. There we are. Is that, uh, uh, that should be, hopefully you can all, is that, um, and I'll just go to big screen. Right. So there, there you are. So, um, yes. Yeah, so my name is Sarah Conroy. I am one of the people Tara mentioned, I suppose, like herself, um, who has spent the last 18, 20 years studying literature, reading literature, writing about literature, teaching literature. Um, uh, and it is a, it is an extraordinary passion, passion for all of us. So what I want to do over the next couple of minutes is to, um, I suppose to explain a bit to you what exactly that means, you will all have heard, those of you who have listened to the, the French taster, the German taster, the, the Spanish taster, the Italian taster, that all programmes in, um, in the School of Languages involve literature. So it's very important to, to realise that, I think, um, and that can, be, that can be a little bit scary in some respects for those who are perhaps not, not big fans of reading. Um, and what I want to try and do is, is demystify that a bit and... Um, and highlight the, the wonderful advantages um, uh, uh, that, it, that it can provide. For many, of course, I'm sure you already love literature and you're already reading lots, but I do realize that for, for, for some people, a be beginning to start languages, or I mean, continuing their languages, it's the language themselves that they think they're interested in and the whole notion of reading lengthy books and poems and so on might seem a bit scary. So I want to just talk about that and, uh, and open up a little, a little bit about that. So why study literature? Um, and um, what exactly does that mean? Uh, what, what do we mean by that when we say we study literature? Um, you might like to think as a way in, what, what was the last book you read yourself? We might come back to that maybe in the questions and answers. Um, or, or what do you think literature is? What's the point of writing? Why do writers write? Why do, why do authors write? Why do novelists write? Uh, or of reading? Why do we read it in the first place? So, now we could, by way as a, of a way in, I could, and I've done, I want to give you here a number of um, terribly lofty, uh, but beautiful, but, but lofty uh, quotations, just to, just to as, as a way in. So according to Salman Rushdie, literature is where I go to explore the highest and the lowest places in human society and in the human spirit. Now, that is, is, is beautifully said. It mightn't make much sense just yet. Poetry, according to Edgar Allan Poe, is the rhythmical creation of beauty in words. Very nice. Or, I love this one, poetry is when an emotion has found its thought and the thought has found words. Now, you might think, well, that's all, 
grand it sounds very grandiose but what on earth has that got to do with me so again it might seem very highbrow it might seem very lofty and i suppose it's important to remember that you know you all i'm sure have come across um uh, 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 books, passages of books, poems, a yeah, song, uh, something that that you that me that speaks to you, that means something to you, that that moves you, that entertains you on one level, that moves you or that makes you think. And I suppose that's 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 what it's all about. So so if you can get away from the kind of the loftiness, um, not that I'm trying to be anti-intellectual, but it's just that I'm, I'm going to try and you know get, alert you to the fact that you are all we're all involved in literature and language, uh, possibly without necessarily being aware of it. So. What do we look at? How do we, what we try and do in, in studying literature is to give you access. As I said a moment ago, you might have had a favorite passage or a favorite poem or a favorite song, and you think that's beautiful, but I, I don't know how it's beautiful. Or I don't know why that's moving me this way, or I don't know, or, or if you're looking at a painting or reading a, a poem and think, I have no idea what they're talking about. So what we try and do is essentially unpick that text, unpick that by looking at both form. So you hear a lot about form and content. Formal features. Now, by formal features, we mean style and uh, language that could involve metaphor, image. I'm sure you've come across metaphor and image uh, in your study of English. Um, you know, similes, any of those formal devices, actually rhetorical devices that are used. So, how does that inter, inter in overlap or intertwine with content? Some of the pieces we would study in all of the languages across the four years have a very obvious message in inverted commas. They might be very politically driven. Um, but either way, there will there'll be ideas, very clear ideas behind that. And I'll come back to the history of ideas in a moment. But sometimes more, more, more meaningfully in many respects or more something that's relevant to all of us is, is that they provide some kind of insight to, into, into the human condition. And again, I hope that doesn't sound too, too grandiose. What it is to be human. We're all look at look at the success normal people has had recently you know what and that's a magnificent novel what what it is to be human the highs and lows the struggles the triumphs of life you know what what are we all doing here and that's what i guess was what all humanities um uh, modules and courses and, and investigation is about so so it, it's not all about a message of some sort students often think that they, they, they the writers trying to say something sometimes they are sometimes it can be very as i said very political or it can be a comment on society Sometimes it's quite simply and most meaningfully about what it is to try and deal with life today, basically, or at that at that period. Now, over the over the course of the um, the last five hundred years, uh, obviously, different people have dealt with that in different national literatures differently. So, in the school, as you will have heard over the last uh, um, hour or so, or if you or if you haven't, you're just joining us now. I'll remind you. We four we can study the literatures of four languages independently, um, or I mean, we don't. What I mean is, there's no comparative. Um, degree per se, there are some comparative modules, but we don't look with the, 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 the um, you study individual languages individually. So French and Francophone, by Francophone, as you will have heard earlier, no doubt from many, we include the Caribbean um, um, and African literatures and Canadian literatures, Italian, German and Spanish and Hispanophone, as you've just heard from, um, from Tara. So we look at different time periods right through from the 16th um, to the 21st century. UCD is one of the few universities, if not the only university left at this stage, with, uh, you will all be aware that there have been cuts in higher level education over the last, over the last years. This, the, the coming scenario facing this is going to be very tricky as well. But we've managed to hold on to um, a lot of our, our coverage, if you like. We have uh, in French, for example, I'm the early modernist person, so I started the Renaissance through um, Renaissance in 17th century. We have a wonderful new uh, Renaissance specialist in Italian as well. So we do work with the earlier periods and we have a number of colleagues working on contemporary uh, literature as well. So there's a huge breadth, which um, we've been very, very fortunate to be able to maintain and to hire accordingly. So we look at different movements. Some of you, those of you perhaps interested in music, will have come across the very notion of the Baroque, classical, uh, enlightenment. Uh, romantic, romanticism, the 19th century. Some of you might be familiar with these. And again, if you're not, the whole point is that we provide you with introductions to these. Modernist, avant-garde, surrealist. People often talk about, oh, it was all very surreal. But what exactly does that mean? Surrealism was a particular movement. Symbolism, what, what does that mean? Um, we cover a wide range of genre. And again, obviously, depending on the language, it varies slightly, uh, uh, or indeed varies sometimes considerably. Um, but in general, there would be drama and prose uh, and poetry would be covered um, in varying degrees. Fairy tale um, is, is covered in German, also in early in, in first year French. 
essays, treatises, memoirs. So there's a whole range. So again, literature doesn't just mean, you know, uh, 408 pages of a novel. It may well do, but it isn't only that. And it includes, and I think it's important to flag this from the beginning, what we call the history of ideas. So those treatises, those essays, those memoirs are often, um, often political. I work a lot on, on, on political thought myself, for example. Um, so those of us who are specialists in literature in the broader sense um, uh, include, often, often work also on history of ideas. And I'll give you examples of that in a moment. Um, so uh, why, why do we do this? Why? Why have I spent 20 years of my life looking at and teaching and exploring this and hiding up in dusty libraries in, in, in different parts of the just in different parts of France and Ireland, you know, pouring over dusty books, and I mean dusty books. So I guess it's important to, to remember that, that it's all driven by a belief that to fully understand a country, you need to explore its literature, its culture, its history of ideas. So um, I'd also mention, the, one of the second point I've mentioned there, it's the only way to improve your language skills. Unfortunately, increasingly, a lot of journalistic texts you'll find are really not that well written. And so if you really want to understand how you actually can, you know, construct complex sentences. The only way to do it is to read complex sentences. And so um, uh, many students who, who come in thinking, oh my God, the last thing, I, you know, I, just want to, I just want to learn the language. I just want to speak Spanish and go to Spanish. You know, I have no interest in Spanish poetry. I don't want anything to do with French drama or whatever. Do learn, I think most of our final years would say, oh, if not all, that by the end of it, that they, that they have realized that even on a, a very basic linguistic level, there is nothing like delving into to, to, you know, complex sentences to really make your, your own level of, of um, language improve. That's a very obvious one. Um, but also getting back to my first point, it is important that that's to, to understand exactly what's going on, to understand the, no more than our own country, to understand its history of ideas, its culture and its literature. And it's all, all of those are intertwined. Tara mentioned earlier the notion of content modules and all of these, I guess, are, are, are content, you know, literature is part of that. Um, you will have heard, and again, I'm, 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 I don't want to overlap with the others, but I'm conscious of the fact that some people might be coming in. We have the our BA, the BAIML program. We also have the two um, BA Humanities programs. So all of those programs involve the study of literature, the study of content modules. And if we get a chance, I might come back to at the end, particularly to the European English and World Literature program, which involves, which is a type of, of joint BA in many respects, but with that added uh, and very crucial um, uh, uh, emphasis on world literature, uh, on, on um, so Anglophone literatures written in Africa and, um, in, um, and in parts of Asia, India, uh, and then uh, European literatures in the language, in French and Spanish, studied or, or written in different parts of, uh, of Asia and Africa as well. So it's a, it has that extra, extra layer, which is really, really interesting. Um, I want to, I'm conscious of um, time, uh, I've probably gone too fast, but anyway, I, I, I'd rather do that and um, hopefully have time for questions and answers. I want to give you an example of um, a couple of literature courses that I teach myself, for example. So I'm, I'm the um, early modern French person, as I mentioned, and so uh, modules of my literature modules or history of ideas modules look at 17th century France. So 17th century France um, uh, is known often as le grand siècle, so literally the great century. Uh, it's frequently associated with drama. There are 1,400 plays currently in the long room in Trinity. People often think of the long room as just the long room itself. You may not be aware that there is all of those books in the long room are, you know, books that are consulted by, by researchers like, like me and many others. Um, Trinity spent a lot of money some years ago on, 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 a, on, a, on procuring that. And so they have an extraordinary wealth of 17th century uh, drama, one of the biggest outside France. It's often associated with moralists, um, with the fairy tale. I'm sure you're all familiar with Beauty and the Beast. You may or may not know that Beauty and the Beast was written in 17th century France, as was uh, Little Red Riding Hood, which isn't really about a little girl and a wolf. As you, again, you may know, there's other layers there. It's associated with the scientific revolution. It's extraordinary wealth of, of, um, of, of, um, of different, you know, um, I suppose, domains that are developing at the time. But I wanted to just highlight, for example, the type of two areas that are relevant, very, very relevant today, and that I think would give you an idea of where research and literature can lead you. And these are, again, from modules that I teach. So one of the, te one of the modules I teach is entitled Versailles, Politics, Power and Spectacle. Um, that photograph, by the way, that image of Versailles is a more recent one. It didn't look like that in the 17th century. It was a much smaller uh, a castle. Um, one of the things we look at, and the students have just finished it actually, and it all, the students have really, really enjoyed it, uh, is the political theory behind Louis XIV. Some of you may have visited Versailles, or you may have heard of it. Some of you may have heard of Louis XIV. 
Um, and we look in one of the weeks at uh, political theory behind it. What, how, how did he create this myth of the Sun King? Uh, as for obvious reasons, the idea, idea of image building and politics is extraordinarily resonant and awfully horribly resonant, given the, the disastrous scenarios that we're living in various parts of the world today. But what, some of the questions we look at are what makes a good ruler? Who is the ruler answerable to? What is a tyrant? When is rebellion justified? Um, and we look at a range of political treatises. And I mentioned this because this comes into its history of ideas, but it comes under the global literature because sometimes those ideas are actually... Um, vehicled through poetry, through the novel, through plays, definitely through plays. A lot of the plays at the time are highly political. Um, and, uh, and you can get a, um, um, you know, they, they, we look at, we compare and contrast different, um, different political treatises at, at, at the time. Um, another example, a second one, and I'll, I'll finish on that, is um, equality. Many people think today that equality began maybe with the suffragettes, and what many are not aware of is the fact that it um, goes back, well, in reality goes back 2,000 years, but certainly very, very, very obviously goes back um, to, to, to the early modern period across Europe, huge outpouring of texts in, um, in Italy, in England, and in, in France, in Germany also. Um, I've just given you some of the, again, the type might look rather exotic. Um, one of the first egalitarian treatises in Europe is L'Egalité des Hommes et des Femmes, so you can, Equality of Men and Women, 1622. And it's a text that literally could have been written yesterday. It is incredibly modern by our sense uh, in terms of the, the justification. It's about men and women, but in actual fact, it addresses equality across the board, because if you can justify the equality of men and women, you can justify all sorts of equalities across ethnic uh, and, and class um, uh, divisions. So it, it's again, it's a really, really interesting the, the whole notion of feminism, people are always surprised, students are often surprised that that's what, you know, that, that, that there is a history to it um, uh, and there is a very, very rich history. So I suppose I'm just mentioning that as an example. Again, we look at, 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 at uh, treatises concerning it, but you would find ideas concerning, vehicle, uh, uh, concerning equality vehicled through, um, through, through poetry and through, and through drama and fiction as well. So, so all of that to say that within the notion of literature, you can end up with a very, a very, very broad um, um, you know, understanding of, of different cultures. All of it is about unpicking the text. And I suppose that's what, that's what we try and teach you how to do. I'm going to exit my own screen and go back and um, hopefully you can um, see me. Um, um, have I... So, oh, I don't know where the meeting has gone. Uh, Emer, can you, um, am I, I presume I'm still visible? We can, we can see you, absolutely. Good, good, so I'll just keep talking. <laughs> Um, so yes, so yes, yeah, so all all of it, all of it, all of that is about unpicking the text basically, and, and working out what's going on, what's what exactly, uh, how does it work? How if you're moved, as I said, to get back to my point at the beginning, if you're moved by a piece of literature, or if you don't understand a piece of literature, or if you if whatever emotional reaction it, it, it uh, inspires in you, how does that work? And I guess that's that's what we're, we we uh, try to do. So. Uh, the French have a lovely way of summing it up, which is plaire et instruire, which is literally to please and instruct. But the 17th century added another term to that, which was toucher, to move. Uh, literature is all about moving people, one way or the other, in, in frustration as well sometimes. But it's about, about that um, discovery of, 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 um, of human emotion as well. So I hope that makes some sense. Um, I think questions are often more, uh, it's easier to, 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 uh, to be, I'm looking forward to any questions you may have. So um, Emer, I'm happy to take questions now if there are any. I might get back to, if not, I'm happy to, get to say a little bit more about the um, European and um, European world English and world literatures degree. Uh, okay. That is one of the BA in humanities programs. Um, so it involves it's it is it, it's English with a, a language. I don't mean English with the language, but it's English and French, English and German, English and so you choose another language with English. But it has that layer of world uh, literature options where we look at. Uh, literatures from around the world. It also guarantees you a year abroad, which is very, very interesting. Again, not very, um, not uh, hugely, um, a little bit worrying at the at the moment. But uh, hopefully, that will all um, that will all um, um, 
resolve itself, well it will resolve itself, we know at one, at one stage or another. Um, I'm trying to go back to the meeting, but I'm not sure. Emer, you're saying you can still this see me. You. Yeah, thank you so much, Derval. If you uh, stop sharing your screen, you can come back into the, into the room. Okay, stop sharing screen. I am... Oh dear. Centre stop bottom, the green screen. arrow. Yes, yeah, I know. It's just not... Um, I am sure. Actually, you know what? There we are. We can do that. Uh, stop sharing. Et voila. Voila. So, various questions. Oh, some of them are from the... Okay. Fantastic. There's one really good question. In other courses, there's a project usually in fourth year. Is there any projects in linguistics or in languages? Okay, so in the, actually in the degree program that I just mentioned, or the pathway, the humanities pathway, there most definitely is. Um, there, the final in fourth year, there is a 10 credit pro, uh, project, which can either be related to one of the languages that you've been studying, English or the language, or would involve a, a comparative approach. And again, it's one of the advantages of that degree that it involves that crossover. It involves a comparative uh, supervision by two supervisors from, from, uh, from each, from the, the language and English. So that definitely would. And, and um, uh, the final, all of the languages, so final year French um, and final year, um, I, I'm, I'm better, I'm, I'm, Usually there is a what we call a research in French, research in German, research in Italian module and that definitely, that also is a project. Siobhan might be able to uh, confirm that in a minute. I see Siobhan nodding, so that's good. So that, that uh, is, is usually on offer um, and that involves working one-on-one -on -one with a colleague. So yes, very much so in final year, yeah. Okay, that's great. Another question in is, feminist and is feminism and equality in early and modern France part of the literature course? And if so, do you have to know French? Yes, it, it, that, it is a, it's a final year module. It's not on offer this year, by the way. So if you're looking for it, you won't find it on, on, this, on the website this year. It was an MA module before. Um, you do, it's, it's, ta it's taught through French. Uh, precisely because of that, with the, what I was mentioning earlier, that they, they, they know it's, it's all a language exercise as well. You really improve your language as you go. Um, um, so yes, you do need French for that. And it is taught as a, as a literature course, or as Tara mentioned earlier, a content course. So literature in its broadest sense. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you for a very informative lecture. Great, thanks very much, Emer. And we may get more questions as we run through and we'll run them by you if we do. Sure. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Bye. All right, bye-bye, Dara. Bye. Merci encore. So next up, we're going to bring back in Siobhan. Siobhan, can you hear me? And can we hear you? Let's just check there that we have the chat going there for you. Now, bear with me one moment, please. Siobhan, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you and I hope everyone can hear me. So I will um, share my screen with you. Um, okay, so, right, so, um, right, Erasmus Plus. Now, I should say that I um, joined here, um, well, by a number of other people, but in particular by Anya and Rebecca, and they are going to talk to you at the end because Anya was abroad um, on Erasmus. She went to Salamanca in Spain and she has just completed her final year in German and Spanish. And she's going to tell you a bit about, you know, what she derived from going there. And then Rebecca is doing French and I've forgotten what the other subject is. Rebecca, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, but she's going, she's hoping to go abroad on Erasmus. She's applied to go abroad in Erasmus. And she's in this kind of limbo at the moment that we don't exactly know what's going to happen. It will take place. We just don't quite know when. So they're going to talk a little bit at the end um, when I've set the scene for a bit. All right. So it's myself and Anya and, and Rebecca. OK, so the program is Erasmus Plus. OK, enriching minds and um, opening minds. What exactly is it? You hear a lot about it. It's Erasmus Plus, but we all refer to it as Erasmus. So essentially, it's going abroad for a year to a university and you go abroad in your third year. So you do your first two years in UCD, you go abroad in your third year and you come back in your fourth year. It's compulsory for certain degrees. It's optional for others. All right. Um, uh, so I leave it at, at that. 
Um, you study at a host university, you study through that language, you take their modules, you keep in touch with us, you bring back your credits and then you go into your final stage. So you go abroad for a year, if you're studying two languages, you pick one particular university or country um, and, and, and you go abroad to that. Um, okay, so why should I do Erasmus anyway? Well, it's obviously brilliant and uh, you're going to hear much more about that. But here are a few of the advantages of going. You immerse yourself in the language and culture you're studying and there's no uh, substitute for doing that. You experience yet another different university culture. So you've been two years in UCD or in another university if you're studying there, and then you experience something completely different in the target language, meeting with people, having a great time. While you're there, you would be crazy not to travel around Europe, or you might be in South America if you're doing Spanish, um, and you would visit other students, other towns, other universities, make new friends. That's the next point. You would make friends who speak the languages you learn. So if you're doing two languages, you will be carrying on with your other language as well. Um, so you might also want to try and make friends from those countries. So you keep both languages on the boil, so to speak. And then you improve your language skills and you're prepared for your final year in UCD. OK, um, it's an experience like none other. And here are a few sort of uh, statistics, I suppose. I'm not going to read them out because um, they say the pictures speak louder than words. Erasmus brings people together. Um, we feel more European. We become more tolerant, intercultural awareness. All these things actually become something that, that, that have a real and concrete meaning. It opens up your mind, okay? So it helps you get along with people. Some, many Erasmus people, it says here a third, end up, uh, uh, you know, meeting a life partner from that particular country. So, so, you know, love might be in the air if you go abroad on Erasmus, who knows? Um, it means you won't be lost in translation. There was a, a famous film a number of years ago, Lost in Translation. We talk about it a, a lot of the time. If you go abroad, then you're immersed. You become more fluent in the language, in the culture. Um, and it improves, of course, all your language skills and probably also your own mother tongue. It's the idea of plurilingualism. One language sort of benefits another language. Um, it helps you get a job, okay? Employers are always very keen to know if you've done languages, have you been abroad? Where have you been? What have you been doing? It will help you if you want to volunteer. Um, and uh, it is according to the statistics, and I would believe that it means that you get your first job much faster because you come um, out of it a, a much more mature person, obviously linguistically much more accomplished, but in every sense you have developed. Now, I'm going to uh, let you listen to very briefly a couple of voices, one of whom is Anya talking about their experiences. Yes, Anya didn't know this. Um, and then I have a couple more slides. I'm going to let Anya and Rebecca talk to you. I'm so. hoping to go to Vienna um, in third year. Yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> um, I can't wait. Um, I can't wait to really immerse myself in the culture and to really um, master the language. I, I'm so excited. I was actually in Austria as well. I was in Graz, which is just the south of um, Vienna. So I can say that you'll definitely have an amazing time in <laughs> Vienna because it's absolutely gorgeous. But I guess it just kind of, opened my eyes that there's not just like one culture to Austria specifically like not that it's a different culture but like there's not just one kind of stereotype um yeah Erasmus was great and I, I definitely enjoyed it so much so I was in Salamanca in Spain um so like with our degree like with the international languages you can choose to go to either Spain or Germany and I did kind of a lot more experience with German my German was better than my Spanish having only started Spanish so that's kind of why I decided to go there. And it's a really good time and, you know, just hang out with your friends and have mm -hmm. fun. And you, like, I live in Dublin with my family. So it's, it's very, it's very different to, like, move and live alone and independently for a year as well. So it's kind of something that I'm looking to do next year as well. I think in my first and second year, I felt a bit kind of, like, overwhelmed with things. And I, I wasn't the best because I, I'd gone from being almost kind of top of my class in my languages in secondary school to being kind of either on par with everyone or in most cases a lot of people were a lot better than me 
Um, so I kind of lost a bit of passion there. And then once I was kind of thrown back in the deep end, it was just so nice to get away. And it was so nice because obviously when you're over in Austria, they're all better at German than you. <laughs> so um, it was fine. And then you just kind of like learn to force yourself to just speak to everyone and um, you come out so much better. And then like Anya said, when you come back, there's little things like I find myself missing the library here like there's little things that you just learn to appreciate and love and you come back with so much general confidence that that probably helped with me kind of connecting with my lectures and stuff then when I came back. Okay so that gives you a couple of voices one of whom is Anya you'll meet her very shortly just briefly to um to let you know where can I go okay so you're studying one of one of the languages in our school where can I go we have a number of partner universities um, within Europe and also within South America and Canada, okay? Um, now these of course can change from year to year and could change, will change by the time that, that you come on board. But at the moment, or at least I think the information is current, in linguistics there are a number of partnerships, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland and the UK, all right? So you can of course go abroad and do an Erasmus year whether you're studying a language or not, okay? So that is for true for linguistics, true for science, true for maths, true for anything. In Spain, uh, if you're going, studying Spanish or Portuguese, you could go to Portugal or Spain. There also, I know, is a connection to Mexico. If you're studying German, you can go to Austria or Germany. And uh, uh, you heard Vienna was mentioned there. Um, and there's a number of other different universities. If you're studying French, you can go to Belgium, France, Switzerland. So lots of different universities there. And the way it works is it's, it's an exchange, okay? So students come to us and we send students out to them. So that's how it works. Um, if you are, what else do I have here? Um, then of course, Italian, and there's a number of different universities in Italy. Okay, so, um, I am going to hand over now to the two students who are here and have joined us. And um, I think I'll ask uh, Anya first, if you could um, tell, tell us about, uh, we, you, we heard you on the video, um, so we know why you went to Salamanca because your German was better, but maybe what the experience was like um, for a couple of minutes. And then Rebecca, who is hoping to go abroad to somewhere, has already got her place, I should say, and what the, what the, the application process was like um, for Rebecca and what she's hoping for. Um, okay, so Anya, do you want to shoot off there, first of all? Yeah, um, yeah, well, as you heard, I went to Salamanca in Spain, which I chose that university because it's so different to Dublin. It's a university town, so there's 900 Erasmus students that go there, this big Erasmus community, and I wanted to go somewhere where it'd be a huge university experience, slightly different to Dublin, where people have their home friends there. It's kind of, no one's really living with their family, so it's an entirely different university experience, which is an extra thing that you get from Erasmus. Um, I was, of course, a bit nervous going over. Uh, as I say, I only started Spanish in first year of college so I'd only been studying it for two years at that point um, and wasn't the most confident in it uh, but going over there you really more than anything your confidence in speaking the language is a skill that you gain over there um, so just I know concretely people would probably have apprehensions about accommodation about I think I saw one of the questions there was about the grant and all that so for accommodation in Salamanca, it's not like in Dublin, it's very easy to find an apartment over there. I went onto a Facebook group and the first apartment that I applied for, I got it. And I was living literally on the street next to the Plaza Mayor. So really, really central for 250 euro a month. So it's a hell of a lot cheaper uh, than Dublin as well. Uh, and the grant that you get for Spain, it depends on what country you go to and how long you're going for and everything but mine was 230 euro a month so just the grant alone almost covered all of my rent and um, when you go over to the university itself you there is quite a bit of forms you have to fill out you have to fill out your learning agreements you have to kind of liaise with 
your host university as well as UCD to get all that through so that the grant comes through. The grant won't come through for a couple of months. So if you, you would want to have a bit of savings or a bit of money for that, but it will eventually come through. Um, and yes, while I was over there, I studied mainly Spanish uh, literature. I did Spanish grammar modules, um, linguistics, translation. There's so many options over there because you're studying, it would be like studying English over here. So you have hundreds or not hundreds, but loads, loads of options on what to study there. And then I did German as well. So over there you have to do two, well you have to do 10 credits of German modules as well. So I did a German language module and a German grammar theory module, but you could do it in anything to do with German. It just has to be at a certain level. Um, and I also had some modules, some credits left over that I could do with what I wanted. So I actually started French again. I had done French in first year and then hadn't done it in second year. So I got to kind of brush up on that as well, which was fun. Um, but yeah, no, Erasmus itself, it's just a really good opportunity to go live independently for, as I said in the video, a lot of people living in Dublin, it's not something that you'll necessarily get to do for a while. So it's really nice to be able and live independently and be there just with your friends. You'll make friends so easily. Everyone's going over there and wants, everyone's there at the same reason. It's like going, in, well, you guys don't know, but it's like going to first year college again, where everyone's just eager to make friends. Um, and yeah. So my experience is kind of everything before, but I haven't had the experience of actually going over there yet. Um, as I said, I've just um, applied and received my place, but I might be deferred for a year, so I'll find out about that. But um, I'm going to my third year of um, languages, linguistics and cultures. So just as a timeline of when you'll kind of start thinking about Erasmus, the first meeting I had was in November of second year. Um, so I met with my course coordinator um, and she talked us through our options um and we kind of got an idea of where we could go as well so we could start thinking about that and then um, we got a list of all the universities and the coordinators that were involved with each university so every place that you're allowed to go there'll be um a professor that's connected with that university so you'll be, you'll be able to like meet up with them and talk to them about um any queries you have and um, they'll be able to talk to you about the modules and like the other aspects as well like the student life or Stuff like that so that was really helpful because um i had to put down my top three choices and there was four i was looking at so i was able to set up those meetings and meet with those professors um, and then able to, i was able to make my choice in the end so after meeting with the coordinators um i submitted my application form um, and then i found out the results in february um, and then after that you get in contact with the university over there and they will send you the application form and you apply to them as well um, and then accommodation and everything else comes with that as well and um, so as i said that's been my experience so far um, and yeah i'm hopefully i'm really excited to go like as anya said i think it's such a great opportunity and um, there's lots of supports as well like if you're unsure or um you have any questions like there's lots of people you can go and talk to and um, so it's definitely like a huge part of um, a language degree and there's such great supports and um, as I said in UCD for it so yeah I couldn't recommend it more. That's great thank you very much to both of you I'm just looking at some of the questions coming in and um, so exciting to hear about the the, the build-up for you Rebecca and fingers crossed and um, that it, it will come through next year when the skies open up um, and specifically for you, if I may, uh, in terms of Salamanca, Anya, could you talk about the highlight and also what it was like getting accommodation? Are you still with us, Anya? I think we may have lost Anya. We might take a few other questions. I think, can you hear me now? Oh, gotcha, yeah. Sorry, I think I've been muted. Um, what was it accommodation was one of them and the highlight was it yeah um the highlight probably well, probably isn't necessarily to do with salamanca it was probably a trip i took to porto with the friends that i'd made there so as siobhan had mentioned one of the great things about being abroad is you're in mainland europe you can go 
anywhere pretty easily. Uh, we just took a bus. You'll get used to a lot of long bus rides. That one was five hours, I think. I think I did another one to Saragossa, so that was about seven hours. But they're really cheap, so it's the easiest way to get around. Um, so that was probably my highlight. And then in terms of accommodation, as I say, it was pretty easy. Um, just went on to a Facebook group. There's probably better ways to do it. But I went on to a Facebook group um, that was just people looking for rooms. People will post, I have one room here. This is the area that it's in. This is how much it is. Um, and then just message them. And then that's how I got mine. Um, you kind of are going out on a limb doing it that way. I know a lot of people would have gone over and stayed in hostels for a week or something and just gone looking at apartments. A lot of people went over a few weeks early and to try find accommodation. So it's it depends where you're going in Salamanca is quite easy. I know a lot of people would have ended up in like student residence um, organized by the university as well. So yeah, for me through my application, I know I didn't get there yet, but um, it was through the application that the university offered you um, different like levels of accommodation. So you could choose one that suited with your price range or if you wanted to be in an apartment with four people or one by yourself like there was like those are different options and they were offered by the university itself in the application process so you like again you have a choice you could do that or you could do the same thing that Anya did. Okay that's great and if I could go back to you Anya how long do you think it took you to settle in to life abroad as an Erasmus student? Yeah, I was quite fortunate that I had two other people going to Salamanca with me from UCD that I knew. Um, so that made the experience that bit easier in terms of I had people to go to events with and just to, you know, find my bearings. I would recommend as well making sure that you get an apartment with roommates Um, just gives you kind of already a little network. That's how we kind of made our friend group was people that like me and then another friend and her roommates and that's kind of how that went in. I'd say it probably, I didn't go home for the first semester so I was there from September to Christmas without going home which I would definitely recommend. Um, probably a month. Uh, I, did, it, I, I didn't find it took me too long. I know for some people it takes a bit longer but you just kind of find your bearings and settle in. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Anya. Can I go to you, Siobhan? Just a couple of questions um, on how it impacts on your studies. So one is, during the Erasmus year, will both languages be studied at the host university? And I know Anya did refer to that. If you could talk through that in a little bit more detail. And a second question was, does your second subject, if it's not a language subject, so say if you're studying Spanish and film studies, does your second subject get paused? Now, I'm just going to check and see if we still have Siobhan. There might be a technical difficulty here, so bear with me. No, I was just getting unmuted. That was it. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you for coming back, Siobhan. <laughs> okay, right. I typed in some of the answers as well. Um, so I think it was, will the second language be paused? No, I suppose is the answer. I mean, let, let, let's take uh, Anya's case. She, obviously, she was doing everything through Spanish, but she also kept up with her German. So. Um, if you are doing modern languages, you'd be guaranteed to get a place in a university. That's the first thing. And the second thing is in one that also offers the other language you're studying. So you would then, for argument's sake, be doing your, some Spanish modules there. Obviously, you know, or at least German modules there. Obviously, the, the, the country you're in, that language is going to get more proficient. So it's a good idea to, you know, maybe go to that other country at the end of the summer. Um, and I've forgotten what the first question was, Emer. you said, sorry. So the first question was if it's a non-language subject. So say if I'm doing the DN520 joint honours and I'm studying Spanish yeah. film and I'm in Salamanca, can I continue my film studies or do I put that on hold for the year and focus entirely on my language? Oh, well, that, that's a good question. I mean, you, 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 would be, you would be certainly doing pretty much, most of your focus is going, is, is, is going to be on the language in the country that you're studying okay but we would advise you then to take you know studies in film modules to take film modules 
through Spanish, okay? But I suppose most of your efforts are going to go into, in, into the language. That is certainly true. I think Anya would, would, would agree with that. And Rebecca, that's presumably Rebecca's understanding of it as well, yeah? Yeah, I know one of the guys that's over me, he's doing music in Spanish and he had the option to do music modules there. You only have to do a certain amount of like Spanish related modules, but uh, in, in the end he decided not to. So it's up to you really, if you want to continue the other subject. Another good question is, can you do electives in the host university? Ooh, um, I think I'll have to defer to Anya on that. I mean, it's, it's a different sort of system in a way, isn't it? Because you, 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 you choose your mix of modules, don't you? Um, yeah, I'd say it probably depends on what university you go to. I know in my case, we got to choose, like the host university had no problem with us choosing pretty much any module from anywhere. UCD required you to do 30 credits related to Spanish culture, linguistics, literature, all of that. So, and then I had to do 10 credits in German, but outside of that, you can do anything you like. So for Salamanca anyway, for sure, you could do anything. Okay. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Now, have we got all the questions? Is the year abroad at partner universities in Canada or Latin America still under Erasmus? As I thought Erasmus was just Europe. It's, it's funded by the European Union, but there are initiatives with, 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 with other um, continents. So, so the answer is yes, you do, you do go abroad um, on Erasmus Plus if you're going, for argument's sake, to Mexico. Okay, the last one that's come in, I see, can I do modules in the French language without doing French as a joint? You can. So pretty much all our modules can be taken as electives. Yeah, but there would be, you know, we would be saying in this module, it would be assumed you have standard whatever B2 or B1 of the European Common Framework because it's going to be taught through French or through German or whatever. Okay. There was one other question there. Um which was about working uh, whilst on Erasmus. I don't know, Anya, if you had any experience of that? Yeah, um, I know a good few people got work in cafes and all that sort of stuff. Uh, again, it's kind of, it's up to you. Um, I know I gave an English lesson once a week to a guy in my building. It wasn't really big income, but you know, it was a little bit to keep you ticking along. Um, so again, that's kind of up to you. you. You definitely would have the time to do it. It just might take away a little bit from the social side naturally, because you wouldn't have as much spare time. Okay, that's great. And I think just for, for I think it was Ronan who asked, uh, you, you, there is no barrier to working in terms of the right to work um, uh, in the EU anyway. Um, there's no problem with, with working. Have you any further thoughts or things that you would like to bring to the table or shall we move on to the closing session? Siobhan, are you happy we've covered? I, I, I think we've got through a lot and many thanks to Anya and Rebecca for their input. It's nothing like getting the voices of the students. Um, and the best of luck, Rebecca, we, we you know, it, it will happen. The question is, is when and how, but it will happen, you, 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 you know. So um, yeah, that's what we, we hope for, okay? <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you very much, Siobhan, and uh, to Anya and Rebecca as well. So generous of you to share your experiences. It's been really useful and really practical. Uh, there's one final question coming in. If you were doing Erasmus in a degree unrelated to languages and linguistics, i.e. science, is the course in Spanish if you were in a Spanish university? Ah, well, that, that's a good question. I mean, um, I, it, it'll depend on the university, it'll depend on the course. I mean, there are plenty universities, there are many of them in Holland, I know, for example, that have their courses largely through English. Um, so, so that really would depend. And if you wanted, say you were doing science, you know, your um, uh, subjects will have their own links with universities and they will be able to tell you, you know, what the, the, the lingua franca is. But of course, you're living in the country and, and you're going to uh, pick up a lot of the language that way anyhow. Okay. Hey, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, all the best to everybody. And now it's the Q&A, yeah? That's right. We're going to bring in Bettina, if that's okay. Bettina Miga. Can you hear us and can we hear you? She, she needs to be unmuted. The host needs to. Sure. Oh, yeah, sorry. 
keeps opening and closing. Yes, I can hear you very well. I'm unmuted now too. That's great. Okay. What are the questions that you might have? I mean, of course, I would like to welcome you, but you've already spent quite a number of uh, hours in this Zoom. So I think we can just move to the questions. So we've had a lot of questions, Bettina, about the various different ways to study. Yes. Which is at UCD. Uh, a lot of questions about reading lists, which is very good to see. So I don't know if that's because people are in lockdown and they have additional spare time, but a lot of people are looking for reading lists in all of the subjects. So that's something that I was saying to the participants that we could follow up with next week. Uh, it's great to see that people are thinking ahead and uh, looking forward to reading lists. We also had a lot of questions on careers, um, you know, and the types of jobs that people can go into and the different ways to study languages. So I don't know if you'd like to come in on any of those points. Yeah, I mean, I can just start with the reading list. I, um, it's true we don't have reading lists online for students, but we can make them available. And we actually have a project that we um, started more or less this week, whereby we will be starting to publish things of interest, including readings in different languages like novels and so on, but also translations thereof and so on, on our portal. So it might take a, a few days or a few weeks before that becomes live, but that's one of the projects that we have actually to put things on our portal. Um, so you can pick up things from there and you can also um, let us know what other things you would like to see. So yes, things will be coming online. What was the other question about careers? The other question was about careers and where your graduates go on to work. Well, I think it's quite different uh, and it is changing quite a bit these years. Um, now, uh, when I was checking recently, um, I saw that there, for example, for a lot of the students who study linguistics, they seem to end up in, a lot of them seem to end up in one form or shape in one of these uh, big, um, uh, companies like Google and Twitter and so on and so forth that seems to be I, it was actually surprising to me too but they seem to like to recruit people uh, who uh, who did linguistics there's also an interest um, in uh, some of those big companies um, especially if you have language um, knowledge so um, if you are a speaker of an, a language other than English um, they often like to uh, recruit people for what's called the localization industry, but it's not just these companies. There's a lot of companies now that like to uh, recruit people who have language knowledge, who can do basic things. So what that would mean is that you have um, an arts degree with a specific specialization in the language and this language would then, uh, uh, this language knowledge would then be a specific um, uh, positive on your CV. Uh, and you could then work with uh, any kind of company across the board. Then we also obviously have people who work in the cultural business. There's all the cultural institutes, for example. There could be people working in editing and newspapers. Uh, I think newspapers are probably more or less um, uh, difficult, uh, getting more difficult nowadays, but there's a lot of stuff being put online, for example. So there's actually a huge range of possibilities. And uh, just to say what uh, I think our college principal has been saying for a long time, a lot of companies from all walks of work love to uh, recruit um, BA students and specifically if they have a language uh, competence, because it is a very important employability skill. What was the other question? Um, that's, that's great. There's a couple coming in here now live as we speak. Is art history a good choice with language? What are your thoughts on that, Bettina? Which one? What was the first? Is art history a good choice with a language? Yeah, I think it is a good choice because um, a lot of the things for art history uh, need to be studied uh, using original documents. So um, this is actually something where we've been talking to art history about that. So for example, if you want to do art history, Italian is a very good choice for you. There's also a lot uh, going on with Spanish and French, for example, and, and German as well. So yeah, no, I, I can only support that. You might even want to pick up two languages. <laughs> I like your thinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you can do one as a major and the other one, you know, as a minor or something like that, you know, because more than likely, 
uh, you often need more than one language in your academic life and you can never tell exactly which one it will be but if you have language learning camp competency you can easily swing over to another language with relatively less effort than um, if you had never studied a language before. That's great. I have another good question in here. In order to study linguistics, would you have to be particularly good in another language than English? Uh, no, you don't. Um, there are a lot of linguists who only know English and they study other languages um, as they do their work in linguistics. And if you take me, for example, I do know several languages, but the language I work on most I actually learned it when I went there to do field research and now I use it also to talk to people but you can learn languages as you um, do linguistics. Now it is always good to know other languages because it makes it easier to understand some linguistic phenomena but there's no requirement and remember the university offers lots of opportunities to learn languages with us or sometimes even less uh, common languages with the Applied Language Centre. Okay, that's great. A very timely question. How will the new academic year look? Uh, very good question, because I, today or since yesterday, we've been working uh, very much on that. Um, the new academic year will probably be split in two, so we're hoping to get back to more or less the old normal in trimester two, whereas in trimester one, we will have, um, we will have uh, some face-to-face -face teaching, the sort of traditional things, but there will be a lot of things that will be happening online where either you're asked to do things online or you will be uh, taught um, virtually. And um, so what will happen is that basically you will come on Collaborate Ultra, you will have opportunities to talk to people, you will be working um, on the um, VLE, you'll be doing exercises and so on and so forth. So it'll be a mix of a lot of different things and actually I think this is a very good preparation to university life and to, to, to other aspects of life because you will learn how to manage these different communication channels. Okay, that's great. Uh, a question in what modules do you teach, Bettina? Um, I normally teach what is called sociolinguistics, so that looks at the interaction of language and society. Now, because I am the head of school, I don't teach as much as I normally do, so um, I teach mainly an MA class in sociolinguistics. I supervise MA students, I supervise PhD students, and I pitch in on um, um, uh, sociolinguistic modules at the BA level. Okay. Another question in how will first years be helped in the transition to university, especially within the new online aspect? Um, I think uh, that that is actually something that we're still working on, but um, there will be lots of supports um, in that uh, we will actually explain to you how to work in every module. We will explain to you how to work on the VLE, how we will manage um, classes, for example, whether they be face-to-face -face or whether they will be online. And there will also be a lot of other information available for you. Um, and a lot of it will be actually delivered to you um, in a spoken format or in little videos, which will tell you how to, how to meet other people, how to engage in other things. And there will be a lot of engagement. It will just be possibly a bit more on um, the virtual side than we would normally like to do it. But there's always lots of opportunities to ask questions, lots of opportunities to engage. And I think what might be important to remember is that a lot of this is, is new to you. The university is new. Maybe this way of working is new to you because you might not have seen that much at school level. But the main thing is not to get discouraged quite quickly. So it'll be possibly like a big maze in the beginning, but you will see within a week or two, you will start uh, getting through that. And all our staff um, are very happy to support people. So if you have asked questions uh, and, and, and you feel lost, just let us know. The student advisors, there's the module coordinators, there's everybody to help you. Okay, that's great. One thing we'd love you to do, Bettina, is give us a little overview of the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. What's it like? What's the sense of community? 
uh, just to give a flavour of what, what it's like to go into the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. Oh, to go into, well, just maybe to, to remind everybody, I don't know how much you've talked about it. We are a multi-subject uh, school, so we have five subjects. So linguistics, French, German, Italian and Spanish are the languages uh, or language subjects that we teach in the school. Um, and uh, one thing that is particularly nice about us when you have the opportunity to visit the campus, we have a completely uh, redeveloped premises, so they're very inviting. We, we have nice premises where a lot of things uh, can easily happen. We do have um, obviously our modules, but we also have uh, events for students. So there might be events around careers within the college, but there might also be things within our school. Um, then one thing that is uh, very interesting or very important for our school as well and has been often remarked is that our lecturing staff is very accessible so you can easily come and talk to us. If we're in the university you can come and talk to us in our office, uh, otherwise you can uh, come and um, knock on, uh, on our door using email. So in a way we're a very vibrant community and something that some of you might be interested in, we are very multi um, a lingual and multicultural community as well. I think the last time we counted, we had uh, people from uh, 11 or 10, 12 different nationalities working there. And we do work through English, of course, but we also work through other languages and engage with people through other languages. And that's not just true for the academic staff, it's also true for the office staff. That's great to hear. Uh, and someone's asking what building we're situated in. So we're in the Newman building. Yeah. which is very close to the lake and the library, which most people know. And the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics is on the third floor. Third floor. Yes, third floor, A and D. And a nice view of Dublin Bay, the yeah. two towers, and you can see far beyond Dunleary and to Wicklow. Isn't that correct? And Yes, absolutely. And now I, uh, I actually nearly forgot now. Um, so to, uh, we also have a project which is run by Stephen Luchik, who you've seen already, and Mary Farrelly. Um, on uh, a dictionary for university uh, where you can either find out about particular terms that when you come to the university you might have never heard so you can look up what they mean but you can also if you find certain terms that you don't know you can put them on into the dictionary um, either ask for somebody to define them or you can define them yourself and around this particular dictionary project we often also have interactive um, events so you can come and um, uh, join into these events and this is something that we uh, very much want to foster because we do want to have very close relationships between students um, and, and us in order to really understand what students want and to support their studies. How many students are on the linguistics course on average in first year, Bettina? Another question in. Well, um, that's always a bit of a variable question. I think uh, on average we have about 50, but it, might, it often goes up quite a bit because we have a lot of people who initially don't know what linguistics is because it's not something that's taught um, in school. So they come to university and they see this or they hear about this particular subject. So they start taking one or two modules and then they, they really like it. So in, during the first year, we can have anywhere between 20 and uh, anywhere between uh, 50 and 80 students and around second year we usually stabilize around 70 to 80 students. That's great. A different question here is about internships and what sort of companies we have internships with. If you like I can take that question Bettina. Yes. So the overall aim of the internship is to give people a varied uh, possibility in terms of working in different sectors because for so many it's their first chance to start building up their network and their future career plans. So our internships offer the chance to work in arts and culture, in business and innovation, in public sector and government, in um, um, innovation companies in the tech sector and beyond in social media companies and things like that. And we also have opportunities in marketing and communications organizations and in some advocacy and not-for-profit organizations. So the full spectrum of industries where our graduates go on to work are represented and that's really important. So I hope that answers the question for you. 
Um, we have a question about getting accommodation in Dublin, which is a really good question. Should I get accommodation now or should I wait until the second semester? And unfortunately, we can't answer that question just yet, uh, but we will have more answers later this month. Isn't that fair to say, Bettina? I think so. Um, I think it's, it's a good uh, thing to wait. There might be a little bit more this year, you don't know. But uh, yeah, do wait a little bit. Okay, that's great. Stephen, did you want to come in there? Not, not specifically, no. Um, sorry. Your, your face popped up on screen and I thought you were, you were coming in with a song maybe or a poem. I wasn't sure. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah, I don't know. Are there any other questions? Is it possible over the summer if we can contact you about your subjects? And I think that is no problem at all. Oh, there is no problem whatsoever. You can go on our website. There is a particular feature where it turns around. You will see the name of the head of subject, for example, and you can just send them an email and they can answer you on that. Or you can send an email to the um, uh, school uh, email address, SLCL, and they will hand it on to us. So it should be quite easy to get in contact with us. Okay, that's great. Um, now, I'm just making sure I get into all the questions here. What's the average dropout rate for each year in languages and linguistics? Um, I don't have specific numbers, but our dropout rate isn't really that high. Um, what we typically see, and we are not really concerned about it, uh, um, is that students might change the weighting of their subjects. So because in the first year you usually are encouraged to take modules from three subjects and you might also take an elective, you might actually uh, change the emphasis uh, of subjects. Maybe you thought you were doing X and Y and now you're doing M, Y and Z or something like that. Or you might go into one of our language degrees and you might find that you would actually prefer another one of our language degrees. All of this happens, but the actual dropout rate is actually quite low. Okay, that's great. Now, I hope you have your elevator pitch ready, Bettina. Yeah. Fantastic question for a Friday afternoon. What makes your linguistics course stand out? Oh, very interesting question. Well, the first thing I can tell you, uh, the, uh, this is the only BA degree full fully fledged BA degree in linguistics in the whole of the Republic of Ireland and nowadays also for Northern Ireland. So in that sense, we are quite unique here. So you get a very broad range of what we call core modules. So core knowledge in linguistics. And, in, and, and just to, to make it clear why this is important, linguistics is quite a diverse field. So it is important to get a very good overview of the different sorts of linguistics that exist and at the same time, one of the things that uh, we put a lot of emphasis on is to show you how linguistics intersects with other subject areas. And that basically is also good for this whole range of, uh, a whole area of employability because it does give you a sense um, what you can actually do with linguistics and the diverse ways in which linguistics intersects with other things and the diverse things you can do with linguistics. So that makes it very uh, unique. And obviously all of the people teaching on it, um, all the modules are taught by uh, experts in their field. So um, that is another very unique feature. I'm gonna take a couple of more questions and then we'll probably need to wrap it up. And uh, we are so honored and grateful that you have stuck with us for practically the entire day. And it's been great to have you with us earlier. And Bettina, I'm not sure if you were here for the introduction, but we have people with us from California, from New York, from Indonesia, from all over Ireland, from the UK and from the Netherlands. So we've got a really good range of people the world over. And that's just naming a few of the countries that we have here with us. And um, there's a couple of people asking if you do the DN 520 joint honours, do you take two or three subjects in first year? In first year, we encourage everybody to take three years, uh, three subjects simply because it, it helps you with your choices. As I said, particularly, for example, in relation to linguistics, a lot of students might not actually know what that is because this is not done at school level. So when you take more than uh, two, uh, modules for more than two subjects, that is very good for you because it will help you to really understand the range of things that we have. 
Okay, that's wonderful. Um, would you say doing a joint major is difficult in terms of the amount of work? No, I don't think it is difficult. Um, it's, it's just a normal amount of work that you have to do. Um, and normally we, we manage workloads such that they don't heavily overlap, that we don't ask for the assignments at the same time and so on and so forth. I really don't think if you follow our, our instructions, don't take more modules um, uh, or less modules or whatever, then you know, it should be absolutely manageable. And it should be the same amount of modules as well, whether you do a single major or um, a double major. So the number of modules will not it will be the same. It's just that now you take them in two different subjects. It makes it a lot more interesting. That is very true. And we know that a lot of people continue with their third subject. They take it on as an additional subject and they end up falling in love with that subject. So the two subjects that they thought they were going to progress with, in actual fact, they progress with the, the newer subject that wasn't top of mind for them when they joined. Exactly. And it often happens, especially around linguistics, people didn't know what it was. They go into languages or in any other subject and then they find, oh, I really like that. And then, they, uh, and then we basically pitch them from other subjects. Okay. Uh, somebody here asked, when do, you, uh, when do you pick your third subject in, third, in first year? Well, you could think about it now if you wanted to, because you have a good idea of what subjects are available. But you can also do that and uh, make the decisions in, in, uh, in the first two, three weeks. We often encourage students um, in the first weeks to look around and to basically shop around and then decide which ones do I want to really follow on up with or follow on with. And then you basically drop the one that you're not that interested in. But you just have to remember to drop them on in time so that, um, you know, so that they won't stay on your transcript. OK, how many hours on average would you spend in lectures? And maybe tutorials as well. Can you explain that mix and the different teaching environments for okay. students? Okay, so lectures. What we when we when we talk about lectures, you don't have to imagine this traditional thing. There is a lecturer who is just basically a tech is, is sending text to you. Uh, but when we talk about that, we we might we often have quite a um, dynamic environment where there might be bits where we basically stand there, have a PowerPoint, explain things to you. Then we'd give you exercises and groups to do. Then we might have a little discussion and then we might get, go back to some lecturing. So that's normally done for two hours a, uh, a week. The tutorial would then be one or two hours, depending on subjects, not always the same. Sometimes it's just every two weeks. It's, so it's, it varies a little bit, but those kinds of tutorials are specifically there to help you uh, study um, the content that you heard about in the lecturing context and that you read. So that's where, you answer, uh, where people are answering questions that you have and they will point um, out certain things that are particularly important and we'll also do some more exercises around them. Now, in terms of the hours, I was just trying to think, um, if you have, um, do you have 30 credits um, in, the f in, in one semester? I think, that's, I think that's what it is. So uh, that's, um, uh, how many, that's 15 classes that you would have, is that what it is? Roughly that, right? Yes, that's correct. So that's 15 classes. So if you multiply 15 by two, then, you know, that's 30 hours. That sounds very high. I don't think that's that high, is it? By 20 hours. Yeah, I think it is about 20 hours. Yeah, I, I think 30 sounds much too high. So it's, yeah, it's about 20 hours that you would spend um, at the university normally. And, you know, sometimes that clusters on some days, sometimes it's every day, but uh, we often try to set it up such that there's at least one day where you have nothing. And also to put you at ease, um, um, time, time, the, the core times at the university are, not, um, I'd say around nine to nine to five. There isn't that much happening outside of that, those times. Okay, we might close with a question that relates to that point. How many hours of individual study would you have to do? Well, you generally count for every, if you have a module of five credits and you have two hours of face-to-face um, uh, -face lectures, then we would expect you to do four to five hours weekly for this particular module at home. Reading stuff, 
doing exercise and so on. Now, we, we are very well aware that you won't be doing that amount of time every single week, okay? But you might, so you might be doing one week, you might be only doing two or three hours, and then the other week you might be doing eight hours because you're doing an assignment or something like that. So it, it is quite variable. But one thing that um, I would definitely tell you is that just because we don't constantly follow up, or oh, have you taken this class, or have you read this, um, and have you done this, it does not mean that we don't care or that we don't watch this or that we think, oh yeah, sure, it's okay to get away with just coming to class and listening. If you do not review the material, read the material, or do exercises that we make available on the VLE, for example, it is much harder to learn a lot of this stuff. And what you will end up with is that at the end of the semester, when exams come around, you'll have to cram madly. So I, I think you should definitely uh, schedule in for about two, two, two and a half hours for every module every week. And then the remaining hours you take, you basically work off at the time when you do assignments uh, for a credit, for example. Okay, that's wonderful. There's a really broad and interesting question about graduate employability rates. I might just take that. Yes. No, there's no straight statistic on that, unlike say accountancy or veterinary, when so often people go straight into a job. With arts and humanities and language graduates in particular, a high percentage go on to do postgraduate study and another percentage go on to maybe do internships and another percentage would go on to, uh, to work in full-time employment straight away. It very much varies from year to year, but the good news is that the industries out there want arts and humanities graduates. They want graduates who can think critically, who can do their research, who can synthesize an awful lot of information, and most importantly, and increasingly so, industry wants people who can write, who can write well thought out arguments and who can articulate things because that's so important in, in working life. Um, so there's no, um, uh, employability rate, you know, the year out from college, it varies from year to year, but our graduates do go on to embrace really successful careers across a wide range of industries that I mentioned earlier, business and innovation, arts and culture, media and production, um, uh, and uh, sectors like that. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Bettina, from your end? No, I think you're spot on. Um... Uh, arts and humanities offers a huge amount of opportunities. What I would probably add here is that it is important that you start exploring these opportunities from day one. And the College of Arts and Humanities has started to do quite a lot around this where they offer these opportunities. UCD has an excellent career center. And so I would encourage you even in the first semester to visit um, the career office and ask what opportunities they have. Because if you follow up on these things on a regular basis, maybe do an internship for a month in the summer and but in areas that you think, okay, I, I, I think I would really like to do this, go in and do one because you might find out, oh, this is something I don't want to do. And if you find out this is something that you want to do, that's where you have a connection that you can then follow up. And that will also make it a lot easier for you to choose the kinds of modules that you want to do, uh, want to follow up in, in your studies because then you have a specific goal. So you can do it either way, but I would encourage you from day one to regularly engage with career opportunities that we offer, but also to explore other ones. And the Career Center is absolutely great in, 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 in terms of helping you with these kinds of things. That is very true. Um, they are very proactive and really it is about helping students find their feet and find, find what fires them up so that they can you know, find a career that is for them. And it's probably worth mentioning at this point that there are a lot of options, career readiness modules, um, optional ones that are available for people. And on the humanities course in particular, there, are, there is a module that prepares you for your internship. And like I mentioned earlier on, this is really important in terms of your, the start of your career, the foundations of your career and building up your network. Absolutely. So there it is. Unless you have some final words, Bettina, we might close out this session for today. And once again, thank you so much. Merci mille fois for joining us uh, the world over and for sticking with us and for your wonderful questions and for your engagement throughout this session. We encourage you to keep in touch with us. 
Um, you, you have the email address there, you have the link to all our literature there that I shared earlier on, and also to follow us on social media, which again, I mentioned earlier on, keep an eye out on the events that we're holding, keep an eye out for uh, recruitment days that we'll be holding later on next semester, and keep in touch with us. We're here to help you and to help you make the right choices. Great. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye, uh, everybody. And hope soon. to see you in September. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.